Denny, I'd like to begin with, uh, first of all, that this is going to be a two-part interview. I can see already from our discussion that uh, we'll only be able to cover part of your experience. But let's begin with uh, where and when were you born? I was born, as they say, at a very young age. <laughs> June 4th, 1941, Sacramento, California. Okay. My dad was an architect and my mother a housewife. And of course, shortly after that, World War II started and things got a little busy then. Right. What was your early schooling like? I went to Catholic schools. Uh, I, re I was, my mother's mother lived with us for a rather long period of time when I was a baby. Uh, and she was quite a teacher, so by the time I was four, I was put in kindergarten. Uh, so I was always a year ahead of myself age-wise, but I'm also rather big. So I was tall, clumsy, and a year younger than everybody else, a year less mature. Uh, but basically, I had a very happy childhood, and, and, and I think I learned a few things. Good. Um, during your period in, in uh, high school, was there any indication that you would eventually, I mean, were you, did you play guns a lot? Or, I mean, were you interested in the military? Because your career eventually became into the military. Yes, I, I was interested in the military. Uh, my high school had ROTC. It was a three-year high school. High school started in 10th grade there. Junior high was in 9th. Uh, so I, started, I took high school ROTC, uh, intended to go into the military. I uh, was hoping for an appointment to West Point. Um, ultimately got that appointment. What, was there any family background in the military? Was there any reason for inspiration? or? No, I come from a long line of draft dodgers. Uh, <laughs> uh, my mother's family are German Jews, and they came to the United States just, be f just after World War I. Um, my father's mother was an Irish girl who showed up in Oakland, California, and her, his his father was a, a fellow who wandered in from Tennessee. Mm. Uh, my father's father was a police officer who was killed in the line of duty, so I don't want to make it sound like uh, there was no service. Mm. My dad was a, an architect in Sacramento when World War II started, and he was uh, asked to work on camouflage for airfields. Mm. Um, I do have... Uh, there's another branch of the family that was all military. There's a Fort Gillum in Atlanta named after uh, a, a retired three-star general. But were you aware Gillum. of that at the time? No. Okay. All right. So you, you successfully got through high school. Why West Point? I mean, why was West Point a, a goal of yours? Beats me. Uh, it, it, just because. I was really not interested in the other services. Um, the Army was just it. Maybe it was my interest in Boy Scouts. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's where I wanted to go. That's what I wanted to do. Now, in Boy Scouts, uh, and then eventually into the Explorers, did you feel like you got any training that helped you later in, in terms of your military experience? Yes, just just uh, being used to being outdoors, because I was a city boy. I grew up in the suburbs. And familiarity with ropes, knots, uh, handling weather, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed scouting and was active in scouting from Cub Scouts to the very end. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I'm still active, though I don't go outside anymore. I, <laughs> I help them raise money. Um, so let's talk about your first attempts to get into West Point. First of all, what is what do you what is the the process of trying to get into West Point? West Point is a congressional appointment. As a rule, all members of Congress, including the Senate, uh, have X number of appointments. Typically, it's three or four. Uh, the president and vice president retain some appointments, which are typically given to sort of active duty people or something of that nature. And there's a few more out there that I don't, I'm not sure yeah. how those work. Probably sure. the athletic department has them. Okay. Um, so a congressman typically will have one appointment a year, most years. Uh, I applied. Uh, I was a good student, but not a great student. And uh, I was not good enough to get an appointment out of my senior year, though one of my High school classmates did get an appointment to go to West Point. So I went to junior college nearby, which was very convenient because my girlfriend was a year behind me. Uh, did okay there. What did you, I mean, I don't want all your clever courses, but what did you focus on, political uh, science? Or? I was basically an engineering major. Okay. Right. And one of the reasons was because West Point was, 
it's not anymore, but at that time, everyone majored in engineering. There was, really? There was, there was indeed, in my, the average cadet at West Point during my tenure had four electives, one each semester his last two years. Mm. Uh, so there, there was not a lot of flexibility there, so I knew I had to go that way, and I certainly had some talent that way, so I, I was an engineering major. I'm curious because um, in this day and age, you could literally just get on the internet and look up West Point. I mean, did you do any research? Because you, you, you mentioned earlier about how, you know, because what, you didn't know what, why you were getting it. Did you do any research or go, all right, this is what I'm getting into? Some library time and, and you know, looking at catalogs and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But I didn't know any career military people. Uh, I didn't know a West Point. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just something that I decided I wanted to do, something. You know, when you stop to think about it, though, whether you talk to, you know, a person that went into the military or not, during that period of time of your age, you don't always know why you're getting into what you're getting into. I mean, there are some people, obviously, that are very focused. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a this or that. But so many vets that I've talked to almost wandered into, you know, the particular career that they went in the military. Um, so your first attempt failed. What was your reaction to that? I'll try again. Uh, I did have a plan, of obviously, to, I thought I would probably go to UCLA, uh, probably take ROTC if it didn't work. Uh, but my, my grades weren't good enough to get into West Point my first, after, they weren't good enough to get into UCLA either. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so therefore, uh, I went to junior college, uh, did okay my first semester, did not do well the second semester. So I decided it was time to get f focused, and I learned of New Mexico Military Institute, which is a military high school and junior college. But how old were you at this time? 19. Okay. Uh, asked if I could go there. My family was agreeable to that. I figured if I got out in the middle of the desert, I could get serious about my studies, and it worked. I, I started getting quite good grades. I was on the dean's list and that sort of thing. Were your folks supportive? I mean, considering that there was no background in military history and all that, I mean, were they supportive of you? Yes. Uh, my mom wasn't wild about her son going off into a military kind of thing, but she knew that she wanted me to be what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And my dad was very proud. He, he was quite aware that he hadn't served. Uh, and and he, he, was, he was delighted. So they were, they were Quite supportive, yes. It should be noted, at this time, was there any major conflicts going on in the world in terms of the military? I mean, were people being sent off to somewhere? No, I, I entered West Point in 1960, and there was really nothing going on then. Okay. All right, so how did you eventually get into West Point? I mean, tell us the, the, the details of you. You applied again the, the second time, and what happened? Uh, well, my I just applied again, and uh, I had a rather large academic disaster my second semester at junior college. Uh, so I didn't think anybody was going to pay attention to me, and I was right. So then I went to New Mexico Military Institute and applied again. Well, my grades were up. I was at a military school. Uh, I was staying in touch with my congressman. And as it turns out, somebody he had appointed had stayed one year or two years and had resigned in May, which suddenly gave him an appointment. Mm -hmm. There were three people who had been hounding him about an appointment. Two of us were at New Mexico Military Institute. Uh, so he basically communicated with the school and said, pick one. Uh, well, one of the guy, the other guy dropped out. He, he had decided that he had been in college long enough he didn't want to start over again because everybody goes to West Point as a freshman. Uh, nothing transfers in. Uh, so I went. The deal was then that the other fella and I would go fly back to West Point at our own expense, take the entrance exams there, because that was the only place they were still being given, uh, as well as physical and all that, and whoever did best would get it. Mm -hmm. Well, the other fellow was just out of high school. I had two years of college. If I couldn't have beaten him at a standardized test, I showed something wrong, and I did. So I stayed there and entered. This standardized test, is that... What, like an SAT yes. test? Or, okay. it, it, so I they, believe it was the SAT. Real basic kind of, okay. All right. Um, how were you supporting yourself during this time? Well, one, I was living at home prior to the time going, I went to West Point. But two, uh, my stepfather owned a neighborhood grocery store. And I worked there. I 
stocked and delivered he, free delivery to people in the community and all that sort of stuff. So I was I was doing that, and I, mm -hmm. I I got summer jobs doing other stuff. Okay. So how did you receive the news that you were going to be accepted? You're still living at home, or no? No, now you're in, you're in. I had to fly back to West Point, oh. and my parents had to come up with the money for that because there was no guarantee if I didn't get the appointment. I was just there. And uh, so they housed us in a, uh, there's an engineer company at West Point that maintains the post. They had some extra bunks so that there, those of us that were coming in for this were housed in the engineer company. I found what was interesting is that the, the young lady that I was at that time going steady with, uh, the guy I had taken her away from was a private in that engineer company. <laughs> so it was, we did get along okay, but we didn't see each other that much, but it... Those little idiosyncrasies yes, no, of life, that's yes. That's right, that's yes. right, they come back and oh surprise gosh. you. <laughs> um, once again, the actual process, I mean, how did you actually find out? Was it a letter, was it a telegram, what happened? Well, because I was at West Point, uh, they called okay. and said, congratulations, Gillum, you know, you, this was like the middle of June, and our entrance date was the 3rd of July. And they told me that I was at liberty to stay there if I wished, which I did. What was your reaction? I was overjoyed. I felt like I had had it locked, but there's nothing like hearing it. And then there was ultimately a letter and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it, what, was the next, what was the next step? And I, I want you to walk it through. I don't want to just jump ahead to I was suddenly in barracks or something. What, you now have the formal, the formal uh, notification that you're going to do this. What happened next? Well, I'd been there maybe three days, maybe four, I don't remember. Uh, and most of the focus was getting ready for, taking the test, whatever. There really wasn't much looking at West Point. I figured I had two weeks to look at West Point. And, you know, I bought the stuff that said what plebes are supposed to have memorized. And uh, I walked around and did all, all the touristy things and tried to familiarize myself uh, you know, it's, it's said that regardless of how much preparation you have, there's no such thing as being prepared for getting married or having your first child or starting mm -hmm. your own business. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd, I'd add getting into West Point was <laughs> is in that category, too, because I was totally unprepared. Now, your parents were back in... California. Okay. You're on your own. I'm on my own. And you're staying in the barracks still? Staying in the barracks. Okay. All right. Uh, so, on the appropriate day, I was told where to be when. I don't remember how I got there. I suspect they had a bus or a truck for us because it's three or four miles from where we started. And I was told uh, at what time to be where and uh, I showed up and uh, the, the greetings for new cadets is legendary and very rough. Well, let's, uh, I want you to help me visualize okay. this, okay? I've seen many whether it's comedies or I've seen, you know, movies or whatever, dramatic movies where the guys get off the bus and suddenly, you know, the dramatic military music is playing and they look out. What am I seeing? Well, again, I don't remember what vehicle got sure, me to the area of the sure. barracks. That's, that's fine. But uh, all of the barracks then, and I think now, uh, have a sally port, which is a, a arched entranceway. Basically, the, a sally port is named from sallying, is going out of, typically on a patrol or a reef, mm -hmm. and it's a port, a hole in the wall, which mounted more warriors went out to sally forth from. Okay. Uh, we were to go, go through that, and when we got through there, we were, I think I, we all had like one suitcase and a typewriter, because typewriters were the things you had to have there. Mm. Uh, this is civilian clothes? Civilian still? clothes. Okay. Uh, and the first thing we were told was put the typewriter against the wall, and put your name on it uh, and leave it there. Well, we did. And uh, when we get, got, this is the wall in the, of the sally port. When we got through that sally port, there were cadets waiting for us. Uh, seems to, and, and they screamed at us. Uh, it was the world had descended on you and it was drop your bag. I didn't say put it down, pick it up, drop it. And how many of, of you were there? Approximately. I mean, I'm not asking for exact numbers. 10, 15? Probably in the group I was in, a dozen. Okay. And then how many of the cadets were there, approximately? It seemed like 8,000, but, <laughs> but probably only three or four. 
uh, and you okay. know, then they they took us as we came in, and they processed us, and another batch came in. Sure. There were army enlisted men, sort of gaggling, forming us up in gaggles and sending us through. Uh, they were smirking, but I didn't understand why at the point. And uh, I remember the the cadet officer in charge wore a red sash, and we were ordered to report to the man in the red sash for directions. And there was a we had a string around our neck with a checklist on it on a card, and you'd go do one thing and you'd go do another thing. Uh, you know the haircut, the stop, the haircut, and the stop to get uniform issue, and the Is stop. Is this the haircut this. like oh, the yeah. marine oh. kind of thing? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was all totally stereotypical to what you, what you would expect. And ultimately, we got sent to our rooms where we found out who our roommates were. Well, let's back up a minute because you're in city clothes. So they went. you took it to a tailor, and they tailor-made your uniform. And well, the first thing they did was they they measured you, but they, they had issued you gym clothes. Okay. And the first thing we had to do was go back to our room and change the gym clothes. So we were now wearing tennis shoes and Army athletic shorts and I think in a white T-shirt with... West Point on, and everything else was in duffel bags that we got issued and carried, and uh, it was, it was scary. Now I had just come from New Mexico Military Institute. I had been there a year. The first half year was like a plebe year. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew what the stuff was about. I knew military. I had four, th three years of high school ROTC, so it isn't like I knew the army, mm -hmm. but I knew the chicken part of mm -hmm. dealing with new people. Didn't help me. It was a whole new world, and you know the the, the gray buildings and the, the cadets and the and the everything. And it was also the first major goal I'd set for my life was to be there, and I was there, and it felt like the world was falling in. You know, I get this impression. You, you see these assembly lines of Coke bottles, kind of all just going. Yes. Is it sort of like? The, yeah. You know, <laughs> There is. It's exactly like that. <laughs> you're practically bumping into each other and you rattle, rattle, rattle all the way through this this prearranged course that they've set up. So, what about the clothes, though? I mean, did they finally issue you uh, military? Yes. Yep. We got our we got our uniforms issued. Uh, I they were the, they were issued the same day. Okay. Because we had to wear them that afternoon for our first parade, where they marched us out to Trophy Point, where we were sworn in. Now, would you say that the majority of your group, just your group, I'm not talking about the whole over thing had at least some kind of military training so that, you know, I say march. No. Okay, so you're one of the few that actually knew to use your left foot and your right foot and knew how to... That's right. That, there was close order drill was the, a lot of what we went through that day. But a lot of these guys had never been through this. Never been through it. So I would imagine you could immediately see which guys had some training and which guys didn't. It was, it was very obvious okay. who you didn't want to be standing there. <laughs> <laughs> Or on the other hand, who you did want to be standing near because he'd take the heat and light for you. Uh, but yeah, it was it was quickly obvious. But marching isn't that hard, and mm -hmm. particularly when you're under pressure, uh, you learn fast. Yeah, I mean, there's left and there's right. I mean, yes. <laughs> although I've trained Boy Scouts that way, and you no, I finally had to. All right, left up, <laughs> right up. Okay, that's, so that's right. what we're talking about here. Your other left soldier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, now you've, you've been sort of processed through this. You have your uniform. What was the uniform, that particular uniform? I'm not the dress uniform or anything like that, but what were, what were we looking at? The, the uniform that is, is known in West Point as class uniform is gray trousers, gray uniform trousers, and a dark gray long sleeve shirt, much like you and I are wearing, with a tie. Okay. Uh, hat? And a hat. Okay. The overseas cap. That's what we wore. Uh, we were marched out to for our induction. Boots? I think not. Or shoes. I think we were wearing shoes. shoes. I don't know. Okay. All right. So you've gone through this kind of factory Coke bottle kind of process and now you're in your uniform and they're marching you where? The trophy point is the focal point, it's where the main flagpole is at West Point. And uh, that was where we were marched for our formal swearing into the army. Okay. Now, this is not only your group, but this whole, I mean, how many people are we talking about marching out there? Oh, probably 800. Okay. And we were in squads and platoons in the barracks. Each of us had an upperclassman as a squad leader. So this is a very orderly march. You could, if you were, to say, for example, standing above it, you would see yes. distinct... Company, I think there were six new cadet companies, each of about 120, maybe a little more. Uh, all marching out there. Let's define two 
uh, words and terms that you've described what a plebe is and then what an upperclassman is. Let me back off sure. a little more fundamentally than that. The, 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 during the first summer, that you enter the first Tuesday in July, and from then until academic start in September, that's known as Beast Barracks. <laughs> and the, the, the entering plebes are referred to as new cadets, not cadets. Uh, once you enter the academic, you become a, a cadet. And a plebe is the, uh, the freshman is, some, is formally called a fourth classman, third, second, first. And, uh, the, and they also have nicknames. A plebe is a freshman, a yearling is a sophomore, a cow, where that came from, I don't know, is a, and then a firsty for the same. Okay. Uh, so, and during all of the plebe year, which ended in June when the graduating first class graduated, and everybody moved up one, mm -hmm. uh, plebes were harassed. But it was much more intense during Beast Barracks. And it was intended to be. The goal was to wash out people that didn't that, that shouldn't be there. I think this is an important point to come to because when you talk about World War II Army Air Corps people, some guys washed out. Describe what wash out means. That means for one reason or another, leave. Uh, some people voluntarily quit. They just figured, I don't have to put up with this, uh, or I don't wish to put up with it. Or they cracked. I don't mean in the sense of going crazy, yeah. but uh, just the pressure was too much for them. Uh, or they were just deemed not to have the aptitude to be able to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a dishonorable thing to have happen. Making it to West Point on, on itself is, is something that you certainly could be proud of. It's just, you know, some people can make it all the way through, some, some people can't. Let's go back now to, now that we've defined some terms, let's go back to that moment when you're marching towards that big flag what were you feeling? I mean, you were talking about being scared. You were talking about being, you know, even with your training, you felt a little out of place. But what was that feeling of walking towards that flag? It was a combination of fear and pride. Uh, I was scared to death because I was in, a, in an environment that I had never imagined. And at the same time, I was marching towards my goal. And I didn't fear that I couldn't make it. I just didn't want to put up with all the stuff that I knew was coming my way. Uh, so I was definitely not wanting to be chewed on anymore. Not that it, my not wanting to made any difference. But uh, it was it was a, a marvelous time. I could not tell you I, when I was proud as I could be. So you now all stop. The flag is there. Who's, what's, what's in front of you beside me? Who are the people up there? Some general officers. Okay. I really couldn't tell you. No, that. I'm not looking for specifics, but I just I'm trying to get an idea of you know is there like a, a podium, a stage up there? They're they're obviously higher than you, looking down upon you. Yeah, the, 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 the trophy, uh, the the flag pole on 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 trophy point is the main mast off the battleship main. So oh. so the uh, that what that means is is that. Uh, the only army post in the world where a flag can ever be flown at half mast is there, because it's flown at half staff everywhere else. But that flag will happen to be a mast, uh, and it's obvious there's steps up to it. So the, the the VIPs were up on the steps, and we were at the base. At so, what happens next? I'm trying to visualize. I can see you marching. I can see you there. I can picture the way you're, you're there thinking were a couple, right now. There were a couple of short speeches, and I couldn't tell you even what they said. <laughs> you know, welcome to the Corps, I guess. And then we were told to raise our hand and repeat the following oath. And we were sworn in as the newest members of Uncle Sam's Army. Now, in terms of the next step, you turn around... Where'd they marched go? us back. Okay. Back in the barracks, continue on. Uh, we got yelled at and lined up for dinner and uh, learned about how we were going to eat, uh, how, when we weren't going to eat. Uh, so it was a very, I mean, this is obvious, of course, but I just want to, for the record, 
It was very regimented from the moment they woke you up, and I don't mean you woke up, they woke you up well, until you were told to go to sleep? We weren't, we were, there were three people to a room, and uh, <laughs> uh, we, we were responsible to get ourselves up, because an alarm clock was, but there was a Reveille formation at a certain time, and we had to be standing tall in the Reveille formation. Uh, the upperclassmen came down a little later, so some of, in our case, during the first summer, they were down there waiting for us to make sure we were on time. Um, from there, we went back to the room to clean up and get our rooms ready for inspection, and then we went off to breakfast, marched to breakfast. Back so this to the part formation. is really very much like just regular basic training that oh, you get in the Army very, or whatever, okay? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, so now you're off to the, the, the food, I imagine. This is, this is a, a buffet, a ca military cafeteria style? No, no. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, West Point has always had 10-man tables. You know, four down each side, two at each end, and uh, uh, plebes brace when they eat, sit on the front three inches of your chair, uh, eat square meals, uh, and sometimes don't eat at all if the, if the upperclassmen can want to pick on you enough. Uh, you mean you could be sitting there with a plate full of food and they won't let you eat it? Yeah. Uh, eat bite-sized bites, which is about the size of a thumbnail. Uh, there, there are all kinds of games that go on in the mess hall, but during Beast Barracks, that's a, that's a part of the deal, is that the pressure includes being hungry. Uh, let's, so Beast Barracks, that's the first stage of all this, right? That, that's so the let's, first let's, summer. Okay, let's start with that. Let's, let's start with that. Uh, what was your experience? Uh, the, I, you may not remember the first day, but give me an idea of a typical day in Beast Barracks. Well, most of the training was field kind of training, how to pitch a tent, uh, marching, some marksmanship. Uh, some of it was classroom, academic, military history, that sort of thing, but much of it was outdoors. So typically we'd be up in fatigues, reveille, we'd be down in formation, then back up to our to shower, shave, uh, clean the barracks, get, have the room ready for inspection because it would be inspected every day. Back down for breakfast formation, we'd march into the mess hall, We'd go straight to our tables. We'd stand at attention behind our table, behind our seats until we were told to take seats. Uh, then as plebes, we'd sit at attention until we were told we could eat. Uh, was the food served to you? Yes, it came. Platters of food were brought to the table, family style. Um, when we were told to leave the table, we'd go imme immediately leave and go straight back to our rooms. Uh, presumably to brush your teeth and get ready for the, the next formation, which would be shortly when we go off to do whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were camping, you know, or if we were out somewhere, then an army mess truck would come by and you'd go through a buffet mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was intense, intense, intense. A lot of uh, uh, PT, physical fitness, physical training, rifle drills, bayonet drill, a lot like you'd expect basic training to be like, but with an academic portion, because probably a, a good third of what we did was in the classroom, uh, learning cadet history, cadet knowledge, uh, military history, um, stuff that we needed particularly to get ready for assimilating into the full core when they came back from the summer training. Was there a lot of focus on a particular period of the history, or was it a broad scope? Because World War II was your last major, con well, career. Korea. I really don't remember. Okay. All right. I just remember that stuff was coming at me fast and furious, and sure. I was trying to keep track of it. Sure. Um, I'm fascinated, too, about the, the, uh, the this, this structure of every moment. There's always somebody there to either yell at you or tell you to do something. Yes. And this is an upperclassman? Yes. Okay. Now, you'd mentioned going out on uh, camping. Uh, so this was a little bit outside of your typical day. You would get up in the morning, go through all that, and then they'd get you into trucks and drive you somewhere? Or, or we'd march one or the okay. other. Camp right. Buckner is another military post. It's part of the West Point Military Reservation, but it's several miles away. And you could be trucked there, or you could march there. or. Uh, and when you march, you're talking about full pack? Yes. Okay. And, and we did a lot of marching. And I remember coming back from a long march, there was a small ski slope at West Point. The final thing we did was march up the ski slope. Uh, you know, the, the object was to, 
There's a, it was a World War II song that they're tearing me down to build me over again. Dog Face Soldier, that's the name of the song. Okay. Third Infantry Division songs. But uh, there was a lot of that. There were a lot of aches and pains and muscles and Did you see guys. people wash out? I mean, there was oh, yes. guys, yeah, okay. So th this had to be one of the, the, the ones where a lot of people just sort of went by the wayside or... Yes. Um, how did you know that you'd gotten through that? I mean, was there a, 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 a time period where you knew if I made it to this point, you know, checking off on the calendar in my mind, I make it to this point, I've made it, and they haven't told me I'm out of here, or was there any kind of just formal, okay, guys, today's the day, you guys have made it? Well, made it means graduate, so graduation okay. day. So there was a goal in terms of a time but, but graduate meant graduate from West Point, you know. Oh, because this is only one part of it. That's right. You get through New Cadet Barracks, which is the first plebe summer. Right. Then you're a plebe. Okay. okay. Well, that's better. Okay. Then you get, you come, you, you finish your plebe year. Well, you, now you've got to go through third okay. class year, second class year. So. Did it get, I mean, this is a hard way to put this because I, you know, I, forgive me for not knowing the, the, the wordage, but did it get easier in any way or did it actually get harder but in different ways? For the most part, it got easier. Okay. The more the more you learn the system, the more you learn how to work the system. Okay. Um, so once once you sort of settled into it and figured out how to work it, uh, there were ways to get around things. Uh, there were ways to get back at upperclassmen. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> we didn't do that during Beast Barracks, but <laughs> but, but uh, there were. It became. To an extent, it became a game. And. You had to learn how to play it. Mm -hmm. So it got easier. The, the more you got familiar with it, the more you knew how to work things. That... So from Beast Barracks, you become a, uh, a, a plebe. plebe. Okay. What is the process? Is there, is there a formal process from one to the other, or is it just now, if summer's over with, you've graduated to become a plebe, and now this starts? There was a formation where okay. we were declared that we were now cadets as opposed to new cadets. But the scary part of that was we were in companies just with each other. Now we had to go to companies that were composed of you know, my squad as a as a new cadet was, I think, 10 or 11, 12 plea new, new cadets and one squad leader. Now I was going into companies with, I would, there'd be like three plebes and some third class and some second class and some first class. And they were all knew how the system was and they all picked on plebes. So it was scary. But again, like anything else, you got through it, you met your new roommates, you sort of settled in, figured out who the people were to avoid and, you know. Uh, what were the, the this new, uh, you say new roommates, is this new barracks as well? Or the yes. same? Okay, so now you're in a different area of West Point? Well, they used one central area for new, for, for plebe summer. But the whole rest, you know, they only had six companies instead of 24, so they didn't need it all. Then they spread us out among them all. So a few people stayed in the same general area where, okay. where they were. Most did not. We're going to have to, it's, it's uh, get coming on to the time that I know you need to go. So I just want to uh, move forward and then we'll just start from wherever we leave off. But I'll, I'm keeping my eye on, on, Thank on you. the time here. Um, the, the second stage, if you will, after the, you know, the, the, the first initial one, new roommates, new barracks, um, as you mentioned, a lot more people of different ranks, if you will. Yes. Um, give us a typical, or maybe one day, and it's outstanding in your mind, of that period. A, a typical plebe year day, again, uh, plebes, one of the things plebes did was, uh, most of the barracks in those days were divisions of barracks, which meant that there were four rooms with a staircase going up, and there, there was like stacks of them, it was like row homes. So there'd be four, there'd be four or five stories with four rooms per floor with stairs. And at, on, in each of these divisions, one plea would be a minute caller. And you'd have to, if there was a formation in 10 minutes, you'd announce, sir, there are 10 minutes until assembly for breakfast formation. The uniform is, then you go back in five minutes and do five, four, three, two, and then you go out and join the formation yourself. So on a rotating basis, we did that. On a rotating basis, we, everybody got a newspaper. We rotate who, who got out and got the newspapers, and got them delivered to the different rooms, because Plebe's got one kind of newspaper and Yearling's got another kind of, you know, or combination. Um, and and if, if you weren't pulling any of that, due to, and mail carriers 
the mail got delivered sometime in the morning, so when you came back for lunch, you had to get the mail out. Uh, but given all that, it was it was academics. Mm -hmm. So again, there was Reveille formation. We had to be out there for that. Back in for breakfast, get ready. Plebes rooms were expected every day. Upperclassmen were not necessarily. Uh, then after after breakfast, we'd be back in our room and we would then go to class. Uh, ours was, I think, the second class in the history of West Point not to march to classes. Uh, one of the reasons was they gave us a 20% heavier academic load and they thought they needed to give us a little slack somewhere. Uh, so, and you had to be in class when it started. Uh, the Somebody was designated as the, as the section leader among the students. And it was that person's job to take role call the class to attention, report to the instructor that all people are present or who is absent. The instructor would then teach us, uh, lecture, whatever, typically it was like math. There were blackboards all around the room. He would say, take boards, and you'd go face your board, and he'd, he'd tell you what problem to work, and you'd all work it. Mm -hmm. And then, then he'd call on somebody to explain what they'd done. Uh, the classes were 12 to 15, small class sizes, uh, great every day. Typically, the classes were an hour and 20 minutes long. And then there'd be a 10-minute break, and another one, and then a 10-minute break, and then another one. And then Are we looking at, uh, you just mentioned math, uh, we were all algebra, engineering geometry. We're getting into the higher levels, or are we just yeah. on basic math? Well, by the time we finished plebe year, we were through calculus. Okay. All right. Then history, uh, I would imagine still more history. Yeah, we all took foreign language. Oh. We had a choice of five foreign languages. Uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, German, and French. What did you take? German. Okay. Um, it's an interesting it's, choice for the 1960s, isn't it? I mean, you'd think Chinese would be in there somewhere, but uh, no. Huh? It is now, but yeah, it's not Yeah, I can then. imagine. Sure, yeah. Um, Portuguese seems a strange... I'd have to start looking at my history books for that period of time, why Portugal was so important. <laughs> you know, besides Brazil and Portugal, no, there was no other place to speak it, but that's what they did. It's interesting. Um, what about uh, the food in this stage? Was it exactly the same as before? Exactly the same. But what about the actual formal sitting around the table? Well, did you have to sit on the edge again, or now you can actually sit back and eat? No. Still sit on the Really? Okay. Now, plebes at this point could ask for what was called a fallout, which means you were allowed to let your chin out and just relax and eat. And typically, Wednesday night was steak night, and plebes were expected to have some kind of a skit or something to entertain the upperclassmen, and if there was adequate, they were allowed to fall out to enjoy the steak dinner. So what uh, kind of skits are we talking about here? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, usually humorous, yeah. uh, usually a slapstick kind, yeah. of, kind of thing, but uh, it could be almost anything. On one occasion, uh, this talks about another era. Uh, for some reason, I'd been in the, in the history, in the, in, in the museum that day, and I was enthralled, or that week anyway, and I was enthralled with a German submachine gun. I cannot remember what the make of it was. But I decided what I would do was I'd go take that machine, check the machine gun out, and they let me. I just came in and signed for it, walked off with it, uh, put it on my chair, just got in the mess, I'll put it on my chair, and then went back, explained to my table mates that we were going to put on our German accents and demand a fallout. But we got in, and the machine gun was gone. The waiter, who had been setting up the table, saw it, freaked out, reported to his boss. So I got there. One, I had no skit. Two, I had no machine gun. And three, I knew that I was going to be in trouble because I didn't have a machine gun because I'd signed one out. Well, it wasn't long after that, just a few minutes after that, that some officer came by and said, who's the guy who checked out the machine <laughs> It wasn't so easy to check out a machine gun after that. <laughs> I, I don't remember if we got the fallout or not. <laughs> but uh, certainly if we played on an athletic team, everybody had to play intramurals. If your team won, or if one of the major Army teams was playing and it won, that was grounds for asking to. Well, I know that you're pressed for time, so I think right at this point we'll uh, discontinue this point experience and move on to the next step in your military career. Well, at West Point, the, the big decision everybody has to make is what branch do you want to go into? And uh, most, 
most cadets spend more time deciding what kind of new car they're going to buy upon graduation. <laughs> uh, I studied the tactical officers, and the, I found that the infantry, infantry officers that I respected would also talk to me about what they did. Uh, I decided infantry was my first choice. Fortunately for me, that because infantry was one of the largest branch, two, uh, I graduated at the top of the bottom third of my class. So the, the options, there weren't a lot of options open to me, but I did get my first choice. I did get infantry. Uh, and uh, went off to uh, take on the world, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, first stop after graduation was uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. My class was select, we were unique in, a, in several ways. Uh, one was that the Army had decided to try again something they had tried in their 19, early 1950s, which was to eliminate officer's basic course for certain graduates, mm. to include all of West Point graduates, uh, which meant that I was going, never going to go to infantry officer basic course, but the gaining commands were supposed to give us some sort of an orientation. Well, I had elected both airborne and ranger school, so I did go to Fort Benning, Georgia, where I would have gone for infantry officer basic course. Uh, did get to jump out of a perfectly good airplane in flight. Scared the heck out of me. I was and am afraid of heights, but I did learn to control my fear of heights. Uh, in ranger school, I got to work on it even more. Uh, the, the incidents, the, the things that I had to go through in ranger school, I could talk about forever, but the one thing that I did learn in a way that I hadn't learned it before was that I can push myself further than I think I can. Let, let's go into Ranger, just as a, the concept. I interviewed a Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, uh, who was trained by American Rangers and actually is a Ranger. What is a, a Ranger? There's really two answers to that now. There were not when I graduated. Uh, in Army parlance, there is a ranger school that's, it varies between nine and 11 weeks long, which trains, it's basically light infantry training. During part of our history, but not during the early part of my military experience, there were also ranger units, which were special operations units. Uh, there are now, and there were certainly Darby's Rangers in World War II, uh, that's the genesis. Uh, but I was a graduate of Army Ranger School and then went into infantry, which is somewhat reinforced. But what it. differentiates a ranger from an infantryman or a... Well, in my lieutenancy, none, because they're, the only way to be a ranger is go to ranger school, and if you graduated from ranger school, you were a ranger, and then you went and did whatever you did. If you were going to be an artilleryman, you went to be an artilleryman, you just... But you were at least an expert in light infantry tactics and patrolling, so that if your unit ever needed expertise in that, you had it. Uh, once they started creating, again, ranger units, obviously they, they are very special and special operation type units, uh, but I never had any opportunity, I never had the opportunity to belong to one of them. So the, the tactics, if you will, were more specialized than what a, another a, another. Yeah, the the major function of Ranger School was patrolling. Okay. How to patrol. Okay. Okay. Determining objectives, selecting routes, getting there, blowing up whatever. Um, so, uh, lots of you know, mottos: "Danger is no stranger to a Ranger." You know, lots of good <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. But. Uh, uh, it, it is, in truth, just a very, very difficult, mm -hmm. for me, nine-week course uh, that helped me, one, learn some things about myself, and two, uh, gave me some training in patrolling and light infantry that I would not have got anywhere. Was there any kind of reaction to your being a West Point graduate, either positive or negative? Generally, no. Uh, I kept hearing that there was the WPPA, the West Point Protective Association, and I kept thinking that in my class ring there had to be some kind of a transmitter so that I could talk to the Pentagon or <laughs> something. I think I got the men's room once, you know. Uh, uh, and, but, you know, and to a degree, I, at certain times, uh, when there were West Point celebrations, yes, mm -hmm. the ring knockers got together. Um, 
at one point when I was selected to be an aide-de-camp, the general had told me he wanted a, a West Pointer as his aide. So th there were some things like that going on, but certainly uh, in my first unit, when I left Ranger School and reported in my first unit at Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, there were four lieutenants. One was the first lieutenant, and three of us were second lieutenants. And we were all just young infantry lieutenants. And I was, in fact, the youngest of them in the sense of the newest to arrive, the most junior in rank. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just did our thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious because, you know, as, as a, a lover of history and reading of history, uh, often you come across either, or you, you get across, well, he's a West Pointer, and so there's this medal of respect. And then there's this other element of, well, he's a West Pointer, and uh, he's rigid, or he's, you know, too military, or doesn't understand it. So I, I was just curious to, to, to see if there was any kind of reaction. but. In your case, not as much. It just it, it, well. Typically, it was expected that a West Pointer was more committed to the military as a career. Okay. Um, and I was. Mm -hmm. You know, so I fit the stereotype mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly went through all of the plebe years and disciplines. A lot more rigorous discipline. Most of us learned how not to treat people, as opposed to picking up some of the techniques used at West Point as a model for how to treat people. Mm. Um, but certainly, uh, we tended to be more rigorous in meeting expectations. And we also could be more creative in how to get around regulations. But that part of us was typically not seen. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that there was more of a concentration on uh, uh, emphasizing the history of the military, the history in terms of, I, so that's the way I think of West Pointers is you also are much more rigorously uh, required to understand the history of. That's certainly true. Uh, probably two of the best, well, it's actually two volumes. One book, the West Point uh, Atlas of American Wars uh, is an illustrated, which we had to study uh, for a full year. Uh, it's probably the best history that you can get doesn't dwell a lot on personalities, but as far as knowing who did what to whom and how the battles were fought and what things worked and didn't work, and certainly we are very well skilled. Okay. You know. So an, somebody who joined the Army at the same time that you went in would not have had to study that for a year? Right. Okay. The, All, right. All right. One of the, the friends, good friends that I had, another lieutenant in the company who went through ROTC, uh, I think his major was in business. He certainly knew some things I didn't. Mm -hmm. But I, I had certainly studied a whole lot more tactics, a whole lot more history, a whole lot more military law, a whole lot more army stuff mm -hmm. than he had, and I was a little more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So let's let's place ourselves now at that. Uh, you've left West Point. You're now with this group of lieutenants, the youngest of it. What were your duties? I was a rifle platoon leader of a in a mechanized rifle unit. Uh, I was absolutely delighted. My my platoon sergeant. Sergeant Easley, it's been 40 years and I can still remember, I can still see him and remember his name. Sergeant Easley had been a young man who enlisted in the Army in the late 40s. Um, he was a sergeant when the Korean War t broke out. Mm -hmm. He was promoted to Master Sergeant E7, which is the highest rank in the ar enlisted ranks then, while he was in Korea and was a p caught, captured, and was a POW for a year was repatriated, uh, sent to hospital to be taken care of, was told that he could continue his military career or get out whatever he wanted. He decided to get out. Uh, married, got a job in a factory, decided, nah, this isn't for me. I'm going to go back in the Army. Two things happened at that point. His wife said, I live in North Carolina. I'm, I'm living in North Carolina. You're welcome to come home anytime you want. And the Army said, welcome back as a private. So he enlisted as a private E-2, having been a master sergeant, and he worked his way up to staff sergeant and was my platoon sergeant. Because his wife wasn't with him, he was living in the barracks. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, that man knew more about the Army and about combat and about everything that I needed to know, and he was very, he was the dream platoon sergeant. Uh, he was... He knew how to teach me without making it look like he was teaching me. <laughs> uh, what year are we talking about? 1965. Okay. 
I graduated from Ranger School in December of 64 and reported in January of 65. So the Vietnam War was already... Uh, yes, there are no American troops there. Right. Advisors. Yeah. Um, Sergeant Easley did a pretty good job of teaching me. By May of 65, June, I had decided I wanted to volunteer for service in Vietnam, and I'd put in my a 1049 was an Army request. Uh, it came back disapproved because at that time there were only Army advisors, and second lieutenants were not mm -hmm. uh, accepted as advisors for good reason. Did you have any idea of the history of, of the modern history of Vietnam? For example, like Dien Bien Phu, the fall of Dien Bien Phu. Did you have any, any idea of what? Only vaguely. Uh, I kept meaning to read Street Without Joy. I kept yeah. meaning to read. Uh, I, I basically picked up what the common knowledge was among my peers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to say that I did my homework. I didn't. I was a soldier. There was a war. I wanted to go. Uh, I was young. I, if there ever was a time to go, that was it. Mm -hmm. Uh, that same month that I submitted and got back my request, I met a young lady uh, who I am now married to. Uh, she was from Cleveland, Ohio, and was going to graduate, taking a graduate course at Colorado College in modern dance because she was going to be teaching it. Uh, we met, and two weeks later I proposed, and two weeks after that she said yes. <laughs> uh, but during that like, sort of exciting couple of weeks, uh, in June, the Army landed the, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division, and the 2nd Brigade, the 1st Infantry Division, landed in Vietnam. And suddenly, there was a need for 2nd Lieutenants. So I requested assignment in Vietnam one month, got disapproved the next month, and got orders the third month yeah. because there was a need. Mm -hmm. uh, we did get engaged. I went back and met her parents. She met my parents. And we agreed that if we could survive a year apart, we'd come back and get married, and by golly, we did. Uh, this didn't, and the thing part that, that kind of confuses me is that uh, I understand your reason for wanting to go, okay? You're a soldier, you go. But now you've met a woman who potentially, and it turns out to be true, uh, was going to be your wife. I mean, wasn't there any kind of, wait a minute, why am I going to Vietnam at that point? No. Hmm. Uh, she understood that I was a soldier, I wanted to be a soldier, I always wanted to be a soldier. Uh, we both knew that I was young and stupid as far as knowing what war was about, but we also knew that I had to know. And that I was an infantryman, this was an infantryman's war, and that I needed to be there. And I don't think either of us were as happy with the consequences of all that uh, as we had been two months before. But no, she, she knew that was going to be part of her life if she stuck up with me, and she decided she could put up with it. I have no idea what she saw in me, but I'm sure glad she did. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's move on then to going to Vietnam. Um, what was the process of, was there any preparation? Was there any kind of background history? This is what we're going for. This is what you're going to be doing. Well, I was, I was the first officer replacement to the first to the first infantry division in vietnam they but the inf first infantry division had been tasked to send one brigade so they took the second brigade i don't know why they picked the second brigade and they took they they filled it from all the other from the other two brigades so they got the the cream of the crop pretty much and they deployed uh in my case they said you know report to travis air force base california on this date in this uniform carrying these things uh and I did. Uh, there were just a bunch of us. Uh, I remember that the first lieutenants and above got to sit in first class. Second lieutenants did not. Uh, and the enlisted guys were behind us, and they just basically filled from the front back. Uh, I don't remember much about the flight over, except that I was a little embarrassed that some of the officer, second, my second lieutenant peers were a little raunchy for, around the stewardesses. That's the only recollection I have. And I also remember being a tad uh, frightened, might be a good word. Uh, got off the plane, processing center in Benoit. Now, got off the plane. At Tonsonut Air Force Base. All right, but there's not that many people that have gotten off an airplane. Smells. Oh. What was your first reaction? Because I was born, as you know, in Asia, and so I know what that's like. What was your first reaction, physical reaction to Hot. It? Hot and humid. 
Uh, I don't remember the smells. Really? That's, that's amazing. That's one of the first things that people realize. It's completely different. Smells, sounds, everything is well, different. I knew I was in a different place. Okay. <laughs> and I may very well have noticed them, but I don't remember it yeah. now. Okay. So you get off the plane, and where did you go from there? Uh, the the, the in-processing system, you know, officers over here, and this, you know. And I just basically was a number, and I got followed, and I kept saying, am I going to the 2nd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division, like I'm supposed to? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk to you later, Lieutenant. You know, one of those kind of things. And I guess I was there overnight one night, and somebody said, you know, Gillum and Smith and Jones report over here, and somebody put me in a truck and took me off to the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, that's all sort of a blur. Mm, okay. Uh, I, I remember very little. Uh, I found out that uh, the pl I was joining my platoon in the middle of an operation that they'd been on for a week or more. Uh, my platoon sergeant was a E7, a very senior E7. Uh, my four squad leaders were all very senior E6s. I mean, it was it was the only time I was ever in uh, a standard TO and E platoon that had everybody at the right rank, with the right training, the right everything. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, I told my platoon sergeant, since we were only two days from being done with the operation, I wanted him to continue to run the platoon as he had been. He agreed. I said, I'm going to be your shadow, and uh, I'll take over if I think it's appropriate, but I suspect that I can learn more by being, doing that. He thought there was some wisdom in that, so did everybody else. Uh, that's sort of a blur, too. I just remember there was so much to learn. Uh, apparently, the person I replaced had, he'd started out walking with the platoon, and suddenly he was walking in the middle of the platoon, and suddenly he was walking at the rear of the platoon, and uh, they found something else for him to do. So he, he wasn't a casualty, mm -hmm. uh, uh, wounded. So I was being looked at pretty carefully because they didn't think too highly of my predecessor, but uh, they were, I guess I did all right. Mm -hmm. uh, we got back to camp. I spent about two days with my platoon sergeant, and they announced that he was being promoted to first sergeant. So I got another squad leader who was very, very good as the platoon sergeant. And then I started learning about ground combat in the jungles with the soldiers living in tents pulling guard duty uh, one of my most I remembered that when we were back at the base camp and the base camp I think held a, about a battalion uh, in the general vicinity of Benoit that every night the battalion had one, at least one platoon out setting up a platoon sign ambush somewhere around the mm -hmm. good sense, mm -hmm. and there were a couple of smaller ones. But so when we were in camp, we were eligible to become up on the roster. We did a couple times. And I remember on this one particular occasion, we they told us to set up an ambush at an intersection of a couple of trails. We got there, they weren't there. There were no trails there. There was one, but there was no intersection. And obviously the bamboo had grown and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just picked another location, radioed in, told them what I'd found. They said, that was fine. We came in, did our thing, did the debriefing, went on. A month later, it was my turn again, and they sent me back to the same trail intersection. And I said, it wasn't there a month ago, and I told you it wasn't there. And I, that is the first time that I was really upset and needed to do something about it. But I was then... Uh, I was either a second lieutenant or a new first lieutenant. Uh, the guy who did the briefing was a captain. Uh, I wasn't sure what to do. And I went to my company commander and said, you know, I need to go to somebody. This is incompetence. Uh, I could have told you that that place had been booby-trapped, and they'd still be sending me back there. And uh, basically, I was told to chill. <laughs> hmm. But I think they... I think that captain had a really good heart-to-heart, -heart, but it wasn't in front of this lieutenant, mm -hmm. I'll tell you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, but I, we, I do remember that uh, the, the wonderful, marvelous, well-oiled machine, that was my first exposure to the fact that maybe it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Were you given any kind of uh, tactical or historical or background on the enemy that you're fighting? No. Now, not formally. Now, obviously, the company commander talked to me, and the other platoon leaders talked to me, and the platoon sergeant talked to me. But no, uh, uh, 
the, 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 the deal was the gooks are out there and we got to go get them. The VC, we got to do this, we got to do that, they'll do this, they'll do that, and go find them. And so the whole strategy was to go out and find Viet Cong, or were you fighting against the North Vietnamese or just the Viet Cong? My first tour was Viet Cong. Okay. At the VC. Right. You know, and our, our, our initially our actions were called search and destroy missions. S and D. They turned. They changed that. I think because of political correctness to reconnaissance and force. <laughs> but whatever it was, it was the same animal. Mm -hmm. um, and we learned by experience. I remember one of the first times that the whole company, maybe the whole battalion was out, I don't remember, but the company commander had, we were, that day we were going to go to a pickup point and get trucked back to the base camp, but this was early in the day. We'd been moving for a while through fairly dense jungle. The company commander called a meeting platoon leaders. Uh, we, he, whatever he told us, I don't remember. And as we were breaking up, I was 20 steps from where the, going back to my platoon, we got some incoming. And I believe it was both machine gun and mortar. And of course, we hit the ground. And that, that was the first time that I was ever under fire. And the desire to become one with the earth was very real. But then I realized, one, there's not that much of it. And two, I got to get back to my platoon. I've got to get up and run back to my platoon. I, I could get up on one knee. I had one foot on the ground and one knee on the ground, and my body wouldn't go any higher. So I ran on one knee and one foot. And eventually, I have no idea whether it was 10 or 20 or 30 steps like that, I was able to get up on both feet. But I couldn't get that other foot to get under me. I was that afraid. But I did learn then that as long as I admitted I was afraid, I could function under fire. That was the huge revelation to me. I didn't know if I could. Well, the, the incoming, you know, there's varying degrees of intensity of, of, of that. But were you talking about just a constant barrage of mortars and machine guns, or just sort of boom, boom, bang, bang, boom? Well, it turned out to be the second, but in my mind, for the first time it ever happened, it was like triple the first, you know. It, at first, I thought it was, I thought that it was Gotterdammerung, the end of the world, you know. Uh, but the reality is it was, it was less intense, and what had happened was that my platoon, which was the lead platoon, uh, when we'd stop, we were very close to an enemy base camp, very close. And they had noticed that we had stopped, and they decided that they didn't want us to keep coming. So they opened fire, and basically what happened was my platoon set, down, set up a base of fire, and the the rest of the company maneuvered around behind us, and uh, this is jungle fighting. This is this, this is, is dense fighting. jungle, and and I have of course been in the, not the Vietnam jungle, but certainly have been in jungle. It's hard to imagine looking out and not being able to see anything but just foliage, but yet there's bullets coming at you, or there's bombs coming in, uh, yeah. mortars coming in. How did you determine who to shoot at? That's a great question, and, and part of the answer is, of course, that it's not uniformly dense. Uh, but I remember on that ex that mm -hmm. operation being told that by someone that they had one of the ways you have to do it is you literally have to crawl along the ground. One, it's safer, but two, it's the only way to see, and that very likely that's what the enemy was doing too. So you're you're down there able to see him, or if you're above looking down, you you might be masked by foliage or something. I don't ever remember actually attacking in the low crawl, but that did. I do remember that one mm -hmm. piece of advice. And very often we've shot at the noise, not at a person. Mm -hmm. uh, the firing I did that day was all in a general direction. Mm -hmm. I never saw, to my recollection, I never saw a human being to shoot at. That Did you know what case. your enemy looked like? I mean, I don't mean just in terms of an Asian looking person, but with, you, were they told like a uniform or what to look out for? Yeah, typically we were looking for black pajamas with, uh, with a helmet and some form of uh, web gear, load bearing equipment, uh, SKS rifles, AK-47. So we knew generally what we were okay. looking for. Okay. Uh, we didn't often see any. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of looking. We didn't do a lot of finding. 
After that first encounter, what was what was your routine like, if you will? I mean, were you constantly just going out, looking, 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 and sometimes you got into battle, and sometimes you didn't get into battle? Yeah. You know, we'd be out for three to seven or eight days, and we'd be back in base camp for two to three to four to five days, and we'd be out again. Uh, we were, at, at, at that point, one of only three American brigades in all of Vietnam, and there was plenty of places to go and look. Mm -hmm. And, and we did. Uh, and after about four or five months, the, the rest of the 1st Division joined us. Mm -hmm. So we were then part of a division again. But even then, for the first three or four months, they were getting settled in acclimatization and all the things that you need to do to get. So for the first six months that I was there, we pretty much operated independently. Was the purpose of these missions explained to you? I mean, I, I guess I'm looking for the overall philosophy. You know, the, the Viet Cong are trying to take over the freedoms of the South Vietnamese. Was any of that part of your understanding or? You know, I don't remember. Okay. I learned it all at some point, okay. but I don't remember where I learned it. The, the one thing that I do know that was the standard thing was that uh, there was a division between North and South. North, North, the North Vietnam was elected to be communist. At that point, a huge number of North Vietnamese who were Catholic moved south, mm -hmm. and a pretty good number of South Vietnamese who favored the communist distribution of lands moved north, so that there were a mixture of people like you and I who aren't currently living where we grew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, that created a somewhat unique mm -hmm. uh, environment and language challenges and everything else. Mm -hmm and that the communist goal was to reunite the country by force. Yeah. And certainly, I did see atrocities, so that I didn't have to take somebody, not immediately, but mm -hmm. over time, I did see atrocities, so that I didn't have to take somebody else's word for it that these were bad guys. You see, that's one of the things that I find, uh, it's, 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 it's unbalanced in terms of how the Vietnam War has been presented to the public, and you know, when they think of atrocities, you don't realize that the, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, were not very nice to the South Vietnamese, and they were doing things that were really horrific. And certainly with the Vietnamese that I've talked to here, you find that out firsthand. So you actually, what, saw some of the aftermath, if you will? The only vivid picture that I still have is from my second tour, when I was a company commander with the 101st Airborne Division, and we were fighting our way back into Way uh, after Tet 68. Yeah. And we fought our way into a village right outside of the city of Way, and it was there were two or three dozen men, women, and children who had been lined up against a wall of machine guns, and they, it happened within five minutes, and it, because we were we were approaching, and the attack or the defenses to hold us back weren't working, that the enemy fled, and they just machine gunned them on the way out, and I can still picture that. Uh, and I have no, there is no question in my mind who did it. I mean, uh, yeah. other things are not so vivid, not, not something that I can, right. I can pull up. Let's go into a little more detail of the, the jungle campaign. Um, were you warned about punji sticks and arrows flying out of the nowhere with bamboo poison tips and things falling down on you when you walk into a... Sometimes, uh, because the... As I was arriving, the first group of experienced infantry officers, not just infantry, but principally infantry officers, were coming home from Vietnam from their advisor days. Uh, Fort Benning and other forts were starting to build the training things that trained that, but I never went through any of that. Okay. I did. <laughs> okay. I'm not even a soldier. Boy Scouts, we went through that. Uh, you know, so uh, now obviously people told me about bungee stakes and, and somebody say, hey, Lieutenant, come over. Here's a, here's a bungee pit, or, oh, okay. or or there's a whatever. So there was a a homegrown orientation sure. of that sort. Okay, okay. So I knew what I was looking for, and I knew what I was looking at when I saw it. Uh, and you know, I I remember that my whole I was finishing up my first six months as a platoon leader, and I had not lost any soldiers killed. Uh, and I was very pleased with that. And we were in a company perimeter somewhere. Uh, we're expecting trouble. I mean, it, this was not a 
picnic by any means, and it had been raining, and one of the company mortars accidentally hadn't been covered during a light rain, and they went to shoot a mortar round, and it hit some water, and the mortar round just went out and landed on top of one of my soldiers who was sitting with his machine gun on the perimeter. That was the only soldier I lost in, in that in that tour. And uh, that's a horrific feeling. And you want to blame people, and you know, and, and I'm sure that mortar guy who didn't double check to make sure that there was no water in the tube felt worse than anybody. Uh, but life is full of things like that. Yeah. That was something, that first tour, that was another very telling moment in me dealing with who I am and things that happen in war and uh, the you know, why him and, you know, those yeah. kind of things. As, as you know, I, I interview a lot of uh, World War II vets, and one of the things that's fairly clear, uh, I always ask them, you know, did you feel like you were actually winning the war? Was there any sense of, of movement forward towards Germany or, or whatever? And although they're, of course, very caught up in the everyday moment of, of being, you know, a dangerous situation, there still was a sense of, yeah, we felt like, especially when they started coming out and surrendering, was there any sense of, for, for you, your first tour, that you were succeeding in some way or you were winning this battle yeah, or war? Yeah, because we never lost. You know, we had fights. We never retreated. Uh, there was never a time when we turned and ran. Didn't know anybody who had. Uh, it was only a question of we find them, we'll go the, go deal with them. Uh, so the sense was that if we just keep this up long enough, it's going to work. And that is probably the attitude of everybody that I knew in Vietnam my first tour. Uh, I had one significant discipline problem, and that was that one of my young soldiers from New York City got a letter from his cousin or somebody who said his wife was being unfaithful. And he wanted, he, he said, I just, I got to sort this out. I can't do anything. I want to go home, but if they won't let me go home, I at least got to sort this out. And I told him, you're a good soldier, but tomorrow we're going on a search mission and our platoon has got a company cover a whole company sector. You can walk with me. You can keep your rifle slung, but I need you because if there's a fight, I got to have you. And he said, no. And therefore, I court-martialed him. Uh, that was hard, but that's the only time that I had a disciplined situation that I couldn't work out. Mm -hmm. And I don't care to judge him because he was a darn good soldier, and I don't know what pressures he was going through. He didn't show me the letter. I don't know what it said. To go through six months of combat, and for me to tell you that's the worst situation I had to come up with, yeah. uh, I didn't have any problems. Yeah. How did you get news from home or what was going on in America? Stars and Stripes. Uh, my wife wrote me, my, my then fiance mm -hmm. wrote me every day. My parents wrote me typically once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they included clippings, newspaper clippings, mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. But typically, I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, there was also uh, Armed Forces Radio. Yeah, which I grew up with. Um, so really, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was purely a sanitized. Uh, even reporters, and I remember as a platoon leader, we were, I had a photographer, reporter team mm -hmm. attached to my platoon, and we, we were on a, the rice paddy kind of an environment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we were moving across, to, I don't remember what we were looking for, I don't mm -hmm. even remember, but there was, it was just plain rice, flat rice paddy, yeah. dry yeah. rice paddy, okay. and about in the middle of this field, maybe 100, 200 yards away, was this big tree, and I had told my platoon to sort of center on the tree, mm -hmm. that that's where we want to end up, and we were at the halt at the time, again, I don't remember any details, mm -hmm. And the, finally, the, the old man said, okay, let's move out. And when I said move out, the reporter and the photographer took off at a dead run for that tree. And they photographed us as we came in. And I was so angry, I couldn't stand it. I wouldn't talk to him again. I wouldn't let him around me. 
I said, you know, if you got out there and gotten killed, you don't have gotten blame me. I, I would have had to send people out there to drag your bodies back. You will not do that. And I figured I don't. So I might have been able to learn from reporters, but I developed such a negative attitude about reporters at that point. It hasn't persisted, but it certainly did for all of my time in Vietnam. As far as I was concerned, uh, they weren't concerned about my men or me or my mission. They were only concerned about themselves. With some justification. I wasn't worried about them. Uh, you know, <laughs> fair is fair. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, that, that they were allowed to go out on those missions like that. I mean, now we talk about embedded reporters. I mean, they love to give themselves titles and things like that. But um, I didn't realize that they, that, that they could actually go out on a mission with you that potentially was dangerous. Well, they showed up wherever they wanted to show up, and you know, I'm sure the com I don't have no, well, I did, because my second half of that first tour, I was an aide de camp, mm -hmm. and I started learning about some of the restrictions. Okay. But at that point, if the old man said they were with me, they were with me. If he said they weren't, they weren't. And I know I wasn't supposed to let them get killed. Yeah. So during your first tour of duty, um, what was the, you, you, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get to a question I can't, I can't quite formulate. What was the, the, attitude of your fellow soldiers was it pretty much you're, you're all soldiers you're here to do a job and yeah. you're doing it every day for the most part they were all enlisted not not draftees okay okay because this was the 19 all these soldiers entered the army in 64 okay or early 65 mm -hmm. uh we had the average number of goof-offs and the average number of career-minded and the average number of everything, but they were dependable soldiers. There was never a time that I had to wonder, are they doing what they said they were doing? Mm -hmm. There was never a time when I had to say, that sergeant isn't going to implement what he said. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I was naive enough to probably actually believe that at the time. That all, in, all humans are imperfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, was, I had a really good group of soldiers and and we felt we were it was our job to be there the army's mantra at that point was that one tour is all anybody's ever going to have to serve ah uh, okay so we were doing our thing we were the first ones over there we were showing everybody how to be done the other troops were coming in we we'd led the way we we're pretty proud of ourselves mm -hmm. now this, during this period of time was a revolution in music as well i don't know if you're musically inclined or not i i personally am was there any uh, notice that we've gone from kind of, you know, the crooners to rock and roll? I mean, do you have any of that? A little bit. Uh, I remember one song last night I went to sleep in Detroit City, thinking about the cotton fields back home, and, and, and I want to go home. Yeah. And I think I want to go home was the theme song of every soldier in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, there, we were somewhat aware of it, but it was... We were about a pretty dirty business, and we tended to stay focused on it. Okay. So your tour of duty ends. Well, halfway through the tour, my company, com well, I'd been there about four months, and my company commander, who had deployed the company, and who had been my company commander the whole time I was there, was selected to be a, the division commander's aide-de-camp. Uh, and another guy came down to be our commander. He was fine. And my... I had been there about six months, and my first company commander came back and said, hey, Denny, we've got this new one-star general coming in who wants a West Pointer to be his aide, uh, and somebody who's been in rifle platoon experience, da -da 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 -da, airborne ranger, do you want a shot at it? Well, how could I say no? I mean, I always felt that those were plum jobs and that you had to have connections, and I, I come from a long line of draft dodgers. I mean, nobody knows me in the Army. And so I, I said, hey, Captain Pryor, you know, it's just as good a deal as I think it is, and he said yes. Long story short, uh, the general interviewed me and hired me, even though I was taller than he, which is a very uncommon thing. So the second half, I, this is a guy who had been a hero of World War II, a tank hero, hadn't been in Korea, missed Korea, he was in the Pentagon, and was just got his star, brand new, one star, and he, he was over to, and I don't mean this in an arrogant way, he was over there to fight this war and win it. And he was a cowboy, literally, uh, Texas A&M. <laughs> uh, okay. And General Hollingsworth was 
an amazing man. He, I was in awe of him. And, and our division commander, General DePew, I guess knew him because they fit each other like hand and glove. Um, and they took a division that was, the first division was a little bit too garrisony, and they took us and they really shook it out. And I was amazed. The most momentous time of my time as an aide, uh, I guess I'd been an aide about a month. And the, div the whole division had moved to the field. But prior to this time, the division never moved under the previous division commander. Headquarters always stayed put. Mm -hmm. uh, beer coolers didn't have to move. You know, everything stayed put. We went out, we always came back. Whole division, everything moved. And we were in the, I don't remember where, and the division commander briefing, tactical briefing. My general, after every meeting, would we go back and sit down in his tent and talk for an hour. He wanted to know what a rifle platoon leader thought about him. And I loved it, man. You talk about me being in hog heaven. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Well, this particular night, they gave the briefing of what they were going to do tomorrow, and da-da-da-da. And General Hollingsworth and I went back, and we're sitting outside his tent drinking our beer, and he said, well, what'd you think about the briefing? And I said, this is our first time in the jungle. Mm -hmm. I said, General, it was really clear to me that nobody who had anything to do with that briefing has ever been in the jungle. And he said, you're right. And that's why I said, and he said, I said, General, it was clear to me you'd never been in the jungle. That was the end of the wonderful relationship that we had. Uh, the next day, he ditched me. Generals don't have to ditch their age. They just say, sit, and they walk off. He didn't. He ditched me. He got a helicopter to insert him into a, a night position with an infantry company in the jungle. He stayed with them two days and came back. And from that time on, every, every time I saw him, he chewed me up. Everything I did was wrong. He'd never ever fire me. You know, so apparently, I later on found out that his only child, a son, would have been my classmate at West Point, but was killed in a car accident a month or so before he was to be there. And uh, our helicopter pilot, the general's helicopter pilot, got to know him a little better and explained to me what was going on, that he was treating me like his son. Uh, he'd gotten all he needed out of me as a platoon leader, and now and he wrote a marvelous report for me when it was over. But I got my, if, if I brought his raincoat, I got chewed out. If I didn't bring his raincoat, I got chewed out. Uh, so the last five months of being an aide was not fun. Yeah. But I learned an awful lot. Mm. Mm. I, it, I got a chance to meet with reporters and see this planning and uh, look at the, the, the strange things that went on. Uh, did you Good have did, 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 the reporters I want to talk about, but I also want to talk about the planning part. Was it becoming clearer to you what our mission was in Vietnam and what the specific goals were? Yes. Okay. Because the general had come from the Pentagon, and General DePew had also come from there, and they had the vision of, they were even talking about McNamara's wall back then, of building a wall around uh, it hadn't, didn't they think it was going to be approved, but we were helping these people kick these nasty communists out of here, and we were doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, I remember one briefing where uh, there was an airfield in, the, in a jungle uh, that needed bulldozers or something. And we also knew that an NVA unit was nearby, and we also North knew North Vietnamese that, Army. North Vietnamese Army. And that the South Vietnamese Army unit that we were working with, another div a division, uh, that there, uh, somebody in their headquarters was passing the word to the enemy and what was going on. So we briefed them, and I was part of all of this, that we were going to send five trucks to, with soldiers in them to escort these three bulldozers that we were going to run down the, this road just, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, while the rest of the division's out doing this. And in fact, we sent uh, a battalion of armor. And we had two brigades, most of the whole division, standing by helicopters, mm -hmm. waiting for the NVA to attack the bait. And they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of my friends were in those units. And we dropped infantry around behind them, and we we chewed them up pretty good. 
uh, so I learned about the, that was the first time I ever really understood that there were some people who were pretending to be on one side and were actually on the other and began to think about why and how could it be and that, that there is, it is logical to, you know, when you're in a country that's basically been at war for a thousand years, uh, you have to make some accommodations here and there. I didn't like it, I hated it, but I began to understand it and to deal with it. What about the reporters during this period, not later on, but what was the tone of their questions? Uh, what were they looking for? As a group, they were just looking for a story. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he was an Israeli, and he had been the one eye. Oh, yeah. Um, and he was a reporter. He looked for like Yul Brynner. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And he was a reporter for the Israeli press. And really? Remember, oh, wow. And, uh, and I remember him saying that uh, we had fired more artillery on one of our missions that he fought during the entire six, fired during the entire Six-Day War. Yeah. Uh, now he was really there as a colleague, but the bulk of the, the people were, were there to get a story. Uh, I remember we had, the general took one Australian reporter with us for a day, and uh, we had a run in where we basically found a, somebody wandering around. The general in his helicopter found a, and we landed, we, he shot back at us, we shot at him, I jumped out of the helicopter, went and grabbed him, threw him on the airplane, and we brought him back. And uh, there was an article in the Australian paper about the general and his apple-cheeked subaltern. Uh, but it wasn't hostile to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I sensed that the re reporters were trying to be honest with us, but they clearly were not there to make our lives any easier. They were there to get their stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, there were restrictions on not so much where they could go, but who could talk to them. Uh, but I, I had this nasty taste in my mouth from being a platoon leader, so I don't think I looked at all of them particularly objectively, but I, but I remember the general's attitude was basically that uh, our goal for the 1st Infantry Division is to be on the, on the front page of the Washington Post above the fold every day. Mm. And anything we can do, I remember hearing that said, anything we can do to promote that, because we want our soldiers to be recognized. And General Depew and General Hollingsworth, the, the generals, there was another one too, Mel Zace, their attitude was that if you're a good soldier, whether you're a private or a lieutenant or a lieutenant colonel or a general, we can't do enough for you. Mm -hmm. We can't promote you fast enough. We can't hang enough medals on you. But if you're not a good soldier, we got to find someplace else for you to go because you don't belong in this unit. And therefore, if a reporter helped us get your name out so that you looked good to mom and dad and to whoever else. We did it. There was some self-serving in that because they obviously wanted to be promoted too. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just self-serving. Mm -hmm. They really felt that this was going to be the best unit in the world and they were going to create it that way because it wasn't going to be a nice home for somebody who didn't want to be a good soldier. Mm -hmm. Was there any interaction at your level with the South Vietnamese? Just a little. The general occasionally liaisoned with them, and we always had a liaison officer in the headquarters, and I would always touch base with them, but only just a little. I saw a lot more South Vietnamese when I was a rifle platoon leader than I did when I was a, an aide. What was your impression of them? I liked them. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, uh, a dog handler who worked with me, a corporal coup, most of the time that I was a platoon leader. And he spoke no English, and I spoke no Vietnamese. Uh, we tried teaching each other with some success, mm -hmm. uh, but I just admired him. I, I thought that he was a brave man who was doing a tough job. Um, and I sort of took him as my example of the South Vietnamese soldier, because he's the one I saw every day. Mm -hmm. um, there were stories about how they didn't have any gumption and how they'd cut and run and all this happened. I never saw that. I heard all the stories, and of course you believe the stories to a degree, but when you don't ever see anything that proves it, you start wondering just mm -hmm. how, how much of this is mm -hmm. unembellished truth. And my suspicion was that they're like all other human beings, that there are, there are times when I'm brave and there's times when I'm not so brave, and there's times when I do things I'm proud of, and there's t other times, and they're probably a lot like me. Mm -hmm. 
uh, somewhere along ago, I picked up the idea that I expect you to be as perfect as I am, and that gives you a lot of slack. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm sure they had some poor units. I'm sure they had some poorly led units, some poorly equipped units, uh, and I know they had some good ones. Did you ever get the opportunity in your first tour to, you know, actually have a conversation with a Vietnamese that spoke English that could tell you about his country or about why, you know, did they appreciate you being here? Yes, I remember a couple of times, but I, I don't remember anything about mm -hmm. the conversations. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember the circumstance, but I bet it was while I was an aide. Yeah. Yeah. Because I sought those. Yeah. What was the uh, atmosphere within this, this group of officers? Um, was it very much upbeat? Was there times when there was real concern on the general's part that something might be going wrong? Or I guess I'm trying to get to the, the, the kind of the mood of headquarters and what's going on on the inside. It was hugely upbeat. Uh, we, the, the General Pew, for whatever reason, uh, maybe everybody, but at least he had pretty much a carte blanche. And I remember we, f we found a huge rice cache and exploited it. Uh, uh, and we worked along the Cambodian border. Uh, I remember being with the general in his command and control helicopter flying down the river that was the border being shot at from both sides. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why the general wanted to be there, but I shot back. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we had pretty much car blanche to go where we thought the enemy was, and we developed pretty good intelligence, I'm sure, through the South Vietnamese, because obviously they're the ones who would know. Uh, and it was a very upbeat thing. I mean, it was one, one, gee, we did this, we accomplished that, we're going here, we looked at these three places, we found this here, we're exploiting that. It was, again, this was the first year that there was a full division there. Mm -hmm. There was so much to do. There was so much need that, you know, it's sort of like going fishing in a, a place where the fish have been mm -hmm. starved for two days. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to they're be biting, and they were biting. Did you have any interaction with uh, villagers, or what was the reaction of the, 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 the populace, if you will? The only time I had much interaction, and when I walked through your village with my 40 armed soldiers, it, we don't do much interaction, but when I was not in that mode and I was going shopping, I was looking for some clothes or some souvenirs or a piece of furniture, uh, they were people. Mm -hmm. uh, we laughed about how they tried to beat us out of our money, but no different than you would most places in the United States. New York City. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so my feeling was that they were people who, all things being equal, would like to be left alone. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing ever changed that feeling of yeah. mine. But it didn't seem to be one of the options available in that part of the world. You realize, of course, we're going to have to do this again. We haven't even gotten to your second tour of duty. And we're already marching towards noon. <laughs> we were going to do this fast this time, too. Yeah. Yeah, but I, my curiosity got the best of me. The, you know, the, There's a lot more to talk about, especially the second tour. And then after the second tour, you know, you return to the United States, being in the military here in the States. I really want to hear your reactions to, uh, and, and not now, obviously, but, you know, the, the whole attitude of the country changing, uh, what happened after you got back. So there's a lot more to cover. But let's, let's try and fill up the next few minutes with uh, a couple of more questions. Um, you were mentioning going and shopping for souvenirs and buying you, R&R, &R, or tell us about no, that. No. Typically, there were villages near the first division headquarters was in Benoit. Okay. Zion, actually, and uh, we were less than a mile from a dozen small villages, and we could, and not probably only twenty miles from Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, did we you could, make it into Saigon? Yeah. Well, what uh, was Saigon like during that period of time? It was a fun place. Yeah. Very uh, French, I take it. Oh, very French. Um, you know, every, you know, there were, you could buy anything you wanted to buy there. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, what would happen is a couple of us aides, there were four aides, a couple of us at a time would talk somebody out of their Jeep or their sedan, mm -hmm. and we'd go in for a day and uh, 
have lunch, do some shopping, whatever, or we'd, if you didn't want to do that or it wasn't your turn or whatever, just go into one of the villages and just see what they had for sale. Um, uh, it was not that difficult. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we, was there any danger in Saigon? I mean, of course, later there was, but at this during this period of time? Yes, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the general rule was that we did not, we carried weapons in the vehicle, but we didn't carry them on the streets. We mm -hmm. could, but we generally didn't. Didn't wasn't a need to. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember. I don't remember if it was me or one of my colleagues uh, took a sedan in and left the the weapons locked up in the vehicle, but they were visible through the windows, and the MPs wrote them up, and we, we got in trouble because of that. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was not that difficult. <laughs> one of my last jobs as an aide, I'd already found a replacement for myself. Uh, I was told the general's mess needs better beer. So I was to go out and find San Miguel, Heineken's, you know. Well, I went every place I could think of, and the American Embassy had it, but they couldn't sell to the military. Every place I went, no, 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 can't do that. So, knowing that the generals who told me this wanted and respond, they wanted success. I contacted a guy, through a guy, through a guy, who was a smuggler. He flew a plane to Taipei once a week, and because I was a general's aide, he would give me one seat on it, two seats, one for me and one for whatever I wanted to bring back, for nothing. Part of his insurance policy, of course. And I said, yes. <clears throat> I was going to go back and tell the general to make sure he wanted me to do yes, but I, I wanted to have a positive solution first. Uh, I came back and was talking to a friend before I saw the general. I don't remember this is the next day or whatever. And I told him what I'd done, and he said, I may have solved the problem for you. I didn't think about this. And he, he introduced me. Oh, I'd, I'd even gone to the Dutch ambassador to try to get Heineken's. He said, I can get Heineken's, but I get it through the American Embassy. The American Embassy had ran a couple of clubs, like officers' clubs, but one of them was sort of half and half. It was sort of half embassy and the half not. And this guy introduced me to the manager of that, and he could get the stuff and sell it to me. So I never had to take the smuggler flight, and I never had to brief the general on it until after I got my efficiency report anyway. <laughs> but I was that close from being on that wow. plane when I met this guy who managed this club that could get me the, and I did get the Heinekens and yeah. the, the Bach and the. You know, it's an amazing thing too, is in America, there's just no real sense of black market. You know, there's, there's a black yes. market in Asia that, that is just prevalent, you know, and you, uh, I can remember as a kid walking down the street and just seeing everything imaginable for sale that this guy obviously didn't buy in America. Okay? <laughs> yeah. He got it somewhere. So he didn't walk into the PX and buy it. Um, just briefly, because we've only got a few more minutes left, uh, give us a sense of what Saigon was like. I mean, the, 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 it's, a, it's a city that's no longer this French colonial environment. I mean, what was, what was your impression of Saigon? Well... The the first impression was the women. Okay. Uh, the you buy me, I love you too much, GI. You buy me Saigon tea, and Saigon tea was you were charged for liquor, and it was in fact water. It was tea, uh, and those girls were everywhere. I think it was very fortunate for me that I was recently engaged, because I elected not to participate in that. Uh, but they were everywhere. If you went for a beer, there were mm -hmm. twenty of them there. Uh, so from the the food, the bar scene, that was, and that was half of this of what we did there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other half, going out to a nice place to eat, uh, doing some serious shopping. I just found it a fun, exciting city. Uh, my background, you know, I was American, uh, some German, uh, English, Irish roots. I'd been in Germany as a cadet. Uh, spoke German, 
Uh, so I was definitely a European, mm -hmm. if you if you would, mm -hmm. and I had never been in this kind of an environment before, and I just I loved it. I thought it was a wonderful place. And your money went a long way. Oh, sure did. You could buy a very expensive meal for Next the price of McDonald's or something like that. Now, of course, we were spending MPC military payment certificates, not not greenbacks, uh, and we could trade them in for for dong for piasters. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I was, I had purchased a car when I graduated from West Point, and I think I had it on like a three-year payment thing, and I got to Vietnam at about the one-year point, and I had decided I was going home with it paid off. So I was sending every nickel that I could mm -hmm. to pay that, and I, I far exceeded that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't have a lot of money to spend, not that second lieutenants had a lot of money anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but... I certainly never had to take the second choice cut of meat or the or not get the better fish meal or whatever and of course the food was wonderful I, I'm, I'm a uh, an admirer of foreign foods there's not much I won't eat mm -hmm. uh, I think the the scariest thing I ever had was vichy swallow and I found out it was cold I, didn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't ready for cold soup and I had that for the first time in Saigon Wow yeah. uh, but it was an exciting time. It was, yeah. it was really fun, exciting. It was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't want to say I couldn't spend enough time there. I just know I always enjoyed being there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I didn't have a lot of interaction with the people one-on-one, -on -one besides the bar girls. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go to buy a, a suit or a piece of furniture, you talk to the, you negotiate, you pay, mm -hmm. and you walk off with it. That, sure. That's not exactly building relationships. Right, right. Uh, but I did have friends who were advisors to Vietnamese units. And for the most part, they had a lot of good things to say, mm -hmm. and they would occasionally introduce me to their counterpart. Mm -hmm. But I, again, hi, how are you? Sure. And we have a beer together, yeah. and then they go their own way. Sure. That, that's not yeah. relationship. Yeah. But uh, I liked the people mm -hmm. to the extent that I had any right. knowledge of them. I was starting to put together the, together the understanding that the Vietnamese area, Indochina, had been at war for a thousand years, most of it, and that this is partially a response to that. Yeah. I also remember being horrified that some of the prostitutes were married women whose husbands were in the military and they couldn't make enough money without selling themselves, and I remember how horrified I was about that. Yeah. Uh, but I also was aware of things going on by the Red Cross, by churches, by, and both the Americans doing things for Vietnamese and the Vietnamese doing things for Americans. Mm -hmm. that, uh, while I never firsthand participated in them, I was aware of them. Yeah. And, uh, I think I would have liked to have lived there. Well, Denny, once again, we're going to have to do this again. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. You know, this is an important part of... Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Good thing we're friends. We've seen a lot of each other. <laughs> um, we have gotten through, uh, you know, your first tour of duty, uh, your second tour of duty. Let's wind up that part of it and move on into the latter, the latter part of your military career. Well, maybe if I c can wrap up one aspect of my second sure. Vietnam tour. Uh, I was a rifle company commander. I got hurt when I came back from the hospital. Uh, it was about time somebody else took over my company and the, I was going to be transferred to division headquarters to, in their operations office but there was about a week in there and the, the battalion commander used me as a liaison to another brigade that we were attached to for a week so it really mm -hmm. the timing was really good mm -hmm. and uh, it gave me a little chance to relax uh, but while I was there the brigade not my battalion but the brigade that I was working with uh, they were in a pretty heavy firefight. This is around Way. It was just mm. west of Way, and it was right after Tet 68, so it was pretty mm. intense. And uh, it was a meeting engagement, and it was one of those deals where the whole battalion was engaged, and nobody really knows what happened. It was so thick. There was a lot of fighting. Took some casualties. But at the end of the day, they had pretty much gotten control of the ground and sorted things out. And we had a division commander that uh, no one was particularly fond of, and. Uh, he called the brigade commander. I happened to be sitting next to him. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and asked him for a report and the brigade commander basically told him how things had gone and that right now it looked like we had, I don't remember, eight, ten casualties and uh, uh, it looked like there were three enemy killed that we had bodies for. And the, and the general said, that's not, that's not acceptable. We have to have killed more people than that if we took that many casualties. And it was really clear, without him saying so, that he wanted bigger numbers because he wanted to look good. And there was a lot of this kind of accusation going on in Vietnam, and this is one time, the one and only time I actually saw it happening. And ultimately, the, the colonel, who I had great respect for, he was not going to go back to his battalion commander and say, come up with bigger numbers. He said, General, what's a good number? Uh, you know, what number will basically shut you up? And he came with 40 or something. And that really made me angry, but I, I, I respected the colonel for having taken the heat himself and not tried to pass it down. Well, I went from there to division headquarters in the operations section where, among other things, we kept track of statistics. And less than a month later, this general was relieved and sent home, which really made everybody feel good. And the new general who came in was one I had known before mm. from my first tour. And I knew him to be a man of great integrity. By uh, relieved, it's, it's not a technical term. So do you, was your suspicion that he was taken out because he was not doing the job or just, he just his time was up? No, it wasn't his time was up. All right. And you know, I, I was at that time, I had just been selected for promotion to major, so I was a captain. And typically the Army doesn't consult captains when they're going to do something with major generals. So <laughs> all I know is that he went away and it was premature. Yeah. Um, but the new General, general Zace, Mel Zace, came in. And about a week after, I ran the night shift for the operations center. Uh, we got this requirement that we had to go through and review every single battle that we had been in and confirm that it did happen and, and go back to the people to confirm the statistics to make sure they weren't padded. And that meant it's a huge uh, endless out. Yeah. I was so proud to do that. I was so yeah. happy to do that. I went back and I even found out that some of the battles that I had fought as a company commander had been padded. And it was probably, a, I don't remember, six week, eight week project. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was so proud of mm -hmm. General Zace, I was proud of the Army, mm -hmm. that this sort of thing was going on. How so, out of whack was it, the numbers? Oh, <coughs> I mean, just prob a rough. Prob probably three to one. Wow. Wow. Because there were some people, and I guess this prior general was one of them, who just felt that numbers were what proved things. Yeah. And uh, it, that was, hadn't been my experience before, and I was delighted to have been there to watch the transition. Mm -hmm. And even though it worked me half to death to, mm -hmm. to participate in it. I could just imagine the kind of work involved. Well, you've got to call people, well, he's not in the sure. country anymore. Yeah. So all we did was the best we could do. Right. But the general was very supportive, and he wanted us to do a good job. And needless to say, uh, I didn't have any trouble being a very, very loyal, hardworking mm -hmm. staff officer for mm -hmm. that man. And I respect <laughs> him to this day. You know, th th this is kind of off track and, and, and way off track, so remember where we are. <laughs> okay. Um, you went through West Point. You you trained in in military uh, techniques and leadership. How did you? And this is a very general question, but how did you rate the fellow officers? Was there was there a sense that that because you know Vietnam gets a bad rap in a lot of ways? Okay, and and uh, not being a veteran myself, I have to be very cautious in how I ask this question. I have due respect to the men and women that went. But, you know, you're mentioning one, one general here, okay, and, but one out of a lot is, 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 is different than a whole bunch of them being that way. What was your overall impression of the leadership that you were in contact with? As a general statement, I was very positively impressed with the officers. Uh, that doesn't mean there weren't some jerks, but there was no more than the normal population of jerks. Sure. And combat, or combat theaters, certainly will bring out the best or the worst in you. And as a general statement, for in my experience in two years in combat, for Americans, for the most part, it brings out the best in you, particularly if you're in a, in a line unit where you're out there being shot at. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see personally anybody that I would say was intentionally not doing his job. Mm -hmm. 
there were some people that I think were in over their heads. Mm. Now, on the NCO side, there was a lot bigger stress on that. Certainly the NCOs that I saw on my first tour, and indeed most of my second tour, because that was fairly on, early on in the war, were the career soldiers that had been in the Army, and they were darn good. Mm -hmm. They were as good as you'd hoped. But the junior NCOs, during my second tour, the Army started a program, which I don't know what it was called, but the slang term for it was shake and bake. If you and I enlisted or got drafted together and you tested pretty well, on whatever test they put them through, they would offer you that when you graduated from basic and AIT, you would go straight to NCO school, and after three more months, you'd come out a sergeant, a three-stripe sergeant, an E5. And if I didn't score there, or I elected not to take it, I'm a private and you're a sergeant, and we've been in the Army the same amount of time, or you come in to be my squad leader, and I've been in the Army four years, you've been in the Army eight months. And I remember being with a bunch of middle grade officers, captains and majors. I don't remember why we were together, but I remember that we were together and it was not a random gathering. And I remember whoever was more or less in charge saying, okay, here's the question for you. Given the some are good and some are bad uh, from the shake and bakes, and the honor graduates became E sixes, which are staff sergeants, would you rather not have any sergeants Hmm. Or would you rather have them? And we were pretty unanimous. We'd rather have them. That the system was not a, we didn't like the output, but frankly, it was better than no sergeants. Yeah. And, and many of them, like typical American culture, rose to the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick was not that they wouldn't rise to the challenge. The trick was that they have the experience and the skill behind it to make it work. And I would guess overall it probably was a successful project in the sense that it did more good than it did damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gave some ambitious young people a chance to really yeah. step out. I'm glad yeah. I wasn't one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, yeah, on the, no, on the subject of leadership, no, no, I, I saw a lot of people who were surprised themselves by stepping up to challenges that they never ever imagined mm -hmm. they'd be in uh, and doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, as a general statement, leadership from top to bottom, for the most part, was mm -hmm. pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. Now, when the new general uh, came in and there was these, these changes are made, you went back and you looked at these individual battles and whatnot, what was your position, if you will, what was your job after that particular task, if you will? What were you supposed to be doing? Well, the operations center is, is the place in any unit, but in this case the division headquarters, where tactical things are kept track of. So if nothing was going on, there was nothing to do. Mm. If there was a fight going on, or 20 fights going on, there was a ton to do. And as a general statement, night was a little slower, which is why I, as a senior captain, was running the night shift as opposed to a major or lieutenant colonel. Um, and therefore, there was, there was time to do this work while waiting for whatever, mm. situation reports or checking mm. on things. On occasion, there was a lot of stuff going on, but all things being equal, mm -hmm. less happened at night than during the day. Which is different than, say, the Korean War, where a lot of the battles were fought at night. Yes. So this is, these are daytime skirmishes, all-out battles and whatnot. You had mentioned Tet 68, uh, Hui. <clears throat> what period of time are we talking about now? This is Tet 68 and Hui. This was okay. I'm, I'm, I, it was March of March or April of 68 that okay. I went to division headquarters. Okay. All right. What was the overall, I won't, the mood is not the word I'm looking for, what was the overall uh, situation? Did you feel like you were in control of this or was it things just happening out there and you didn't know what was happening and you just reacting or were you? Well, when I was in division headquarters, uh, well, there were daily briefings, at okay. least daily, of what the plans were, what this battalion or that brigade or this unit around. But was there was a doing. purpose. There was a yes. a stated goal. This is what we're trying to get done today or next yes. week or next month. You know, this battalion's trying to go this way or this brigade's trying to stop this, and so we knew what the plan was. We knew what the specific plans were. We knew where they were supposed to be if they were going according to plan, and if they weren't there, we inquired why. Mm -hmm. uh, so that because the general was going to ask that question, <laughs> and I was sure. the one he was going to ask. Yeah. So I needed yeah. to know, and and we could go into intelligence assets or supply assets. There were other ways to go around to ask questions if we, if we couldn't get, you know, when somebody you call somebody says, 
leave me alone, I'm in a firefight. You leave them alone, yeah. but that doesn't mean you don't need the information. Right. Did you coordinate at all with the South Vietnamese? Yes, we had some, we had some liaison with the South Vietnamese, which I personally did occasionally, not often. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess one of the things that, that's been confusing to me as I've started to look into the, the, the history of uh, our involvement in Vietnam is that we have a firm grasp of what the Americans were doing, but what were the South Vietnamese doing? Did you have any idea? In terms of the scheme of things, you got this whole battle plan uh, laid out. This is what our objectives are. Where did the South Vietnamese fit into all that? Well, <coughs> in theory, at least, it was harmonized. Uh, the South Vietnam was divided into four core areas. The okay, now we're getting I Corps okay. was the northern core, okay. which is where Way was. Okay. And there was both a South Vietnamese and an American general who commanded forces okay. in that area. Okay. And it was, in theory, at least coordinated. And South Vietnamese units were everywhere from very, very, very good to mediocre to not so good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depended on all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that I became much of an expert at, but certainly their airborne and ranger units were outstanding. Yeah. Um, and some of the units that I worked with personally were very, very good. But I also know a lot of war stories where, but they've been a battle. They've been, they've been at war for hundreds of years, yeah. so it wasn't exactly a. I was there for a year. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And it wasn't my home that was going to get burned or bombed, or my wife that was going to get shot. Yeah. So in, in headquarters where you were, are you saying that there was a, another headquarters, a South Vietnamese headquarters in the same area as where you were? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, not far from, we were a division headquarters. And we worked for the commander of I Corps. Okay. Or, which is the Northern Corps. Right. He, he had a counterpart who commanded the South Vietnamese okay. forces right. in I Corps. Okay. So we worked for him. Right. He coordinated the other activities, okay. but we knew what was going on okay. everywhere, and we often reinforced each other. All right. It's going to sound like a stupid question, but what was the objective? What were we trying to accomplish? I don't mean overall politically and all that, but in terms of, of, of your little patch of what were you supposed oh, to be doing? I can answer that one. All right. Uh, the 101st Airborne Division was in around Saigon when Tet happened. Well, mm -hmm. when the it became clear that Tet was going to happen, mm -hmm. and we didn't know when. Mm -hmm. And we were, the whole division, most of the division, was raced to I Corps to reinforce up there. The 1st Cav Division had just come in, and my brigade, which was later followed by the division, came. We were attached to the 1st Cav Division for a while, and then the rest of the division came in. Because the Marines had I Corps, and they, somebody decided that there was too much up there for them to handle. So. Uh, the CAV came in and we came in behind them. Uh, and we, we the, our brigade, not the division yet, had just settled down for the truce that was declared over Tet uh, when the, the, the North Vietnamese opened the Tet Offensive during the, during the ceasefire. Right. And we were going after the people that had come in. We knew there was a fairly significant North Vietnamese mm -hmm. force in that area and we were going on after them. Mm -hmm. And everything we did was consistent with that. Now, this is the North Vietnamese regulars and the Viet Cong. Yes, were involved. Yes. Or By am I confusing that, point, that with another? No, you're, okay. you're right because right. it, it was it was it was coordinated. But by the end of Tet, Viet Cong units were a lot decimated. Yeah. They they weren't like they had been three five years before. Right. So for the most part, direction was given by the North Vietnamese. Okay. All right. Um, was how how did you determine that the Viet Cong were were decimated? The guys in the intelligence side told me. <laughs> okay. All right. Because I've heard that too. I mean, this is this is common well, they, knowledge. They, you know, they'd been fighting forever, and you yeah. know, they're locals too, and everybody knows who they are. And eventually, right. somebody finds out. That's my suspicion. Okay. But that's. Were you at all aware? at that particular time of the rumblings in the states, the anti-war movement and the, you know, high profile people coming out and saying we shouldn't be there. Yes. And what was your reaction to, to that? Um, I thought they were idiots. Mm. Well, the thing that strikes me, and once again, I'm not, you know, I wasn't there and I, I, I can only speak from one perspective. The thing that amazes me is that we effectively destroyed the Viet Cong. Tet was a success, 
And yet, the word that got back to the states, and, and actually to this day, if you ask people about Tet, that was the turning point in the Vietnam War in yeah, terms of. You know, and it actually was the American, the Allies, the Americans mm -hmm. defeated the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of documents on this, and I've read extensively, you may have too. But the media, the American media, made it a North Vietnamese offensive. The North Vietnamese were seriously considering just backing off. But they won the media, and that's what, that's what gave them the sustaining force. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked a little bit before about some of the media that I interacted with, mm -hmm. and uh, I certainly do not believe in uh, eliminating or totally chokeholding the media, but I am very concerned that the media in the United States seems to be, um, as a group, among the most anti-American. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I just ask for balanced reporting. I, the thing that bothers me all the time is how they, they choose to tell stories in, in a slanted way. You yes. know, and, it, and I'm not even commenting whether it's left or right or whatever. It just they don't seem to be able to get it right. And I think that's all people are asking for is fairness. I'd, I'd go completely with that because I, I don't believe in hiding things yeah. that need to be hidden. Right, but, exactly. But by the yeah. same token, uh, as a guy who saw my men being shot at, wounded, and killed, uh, I wanted I wanted a break. Yeah, you know yeah. I, I wanted the good yeah. things that we were doing, sure. the noble things that we were doing, to have as much play as the occasional yeah. screw up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was the mood of? Well, you, were, you were talking about you knew about the anti-war movement, and you knew you, you heard about you know, what was going on in the states. Was there at that particular time a sense of confusion on your part that, you know, hey, we just won the battle. How come? How come it's being reported just the opposite? No. Um, most At that time, almost all the news we got was from uh, Armed Forces Radio and sure. from uh, Stars and Stripes. Stars and, Stripes. Yeah. and they obviously reported but sure. played down that. Uh, and I'm, I'm enough of a historian to where I know that uh, Britons didn't want to enter World War II. They mm -hmm. didn't want to enter World War I. Americans almost didn't enter World War yeah, II. That's right. uh, Americans as a group, people as a group, think that freedom should be free. Mm -hmm. and, that it, and somebody should pay for it, but it shouldn't be me, and it shouldn't inconvenience me. <laughs> uh, and, and while that's patently absurd, it is also historically patently mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. And we see it today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's get back to headquarters then. Um, Tet ends, what were you doing next? What was the next? Basically chasing them. Okay. Cl basically clean up. And that happened and by the time I rotated home in uh, I guess November of 68, uh, we were basically running operations all over mm -hmm. I-Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, the south, the, the, the first CAV had gone back south and, and the 101st was basically the American mm -hmm. Army presence mm -hmm. in I Corps. The Marines were still there, of course. Mm -hmm. So we were basically chasing the enemy wherever we could find them. And uh, you were part of the. You're, you're saying chasing. So, you, in other words, from headquarters, you're sending out groups of men to into this section, into that section. And yes, we heard there's, you know, guys over there. How did you get your information? How did you know? Because I'm picturing jungles with guys in black pajamas out there. I mean, <clears throat> how did you know where they were? Uh, again, my my wimpy answer is the intelligence guys okay. told us, but I know that we had we relied on South Vietnamese Army for for okay. information. I know that we had all kinds of sensors mm -hmm. uh, that we drop and monitor. That we had special forces guys running around out there, um, but that's. But in effect, what you're saying is that we had people out there reporting back. So they yes. were in danger. They were out there trying to find and, and getting into situations where they get shot at or whatever, but they're reporting back and then we would send in yes. people to take care of that. And you know, basically when I started in that position right after Tat 68, all the forces were here. Mm -hmm. Well, then they got, you know, mm -hmm. and they went further and further. Mm -hmm. And there there was not much threat by the time to where we were. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the occasional mortar round and rocket being fired mm -hmm. in, but 
pretty much at every secure. What, in your opinion, what were the most effective weapons that we had? I mean, the obvious one is the helicopter. I mean, you talk about this is the helicopter was perfect for this kind of warfare. What what kind of weapons do you think were effective in this campaign in the jungles and these kind of enemy? Well, one of the things that we used with, with great effectiveness was artillery. Okay. And that's both uh, aerial rockets and uh, 105, 155, 175, eight inch. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to, I think, the term reconnaissance by fire, harassing and interdicting fires. Uh, we fired an awful lot of stuff, and when we, we did that many times in lieu of sending soldiers out to stomp through the ground, mm -hmm. uh, that certainly was done well. But I don't know that there was a, a particular weapon okay. or technique, but certainly we introduced our mobile operations there, and that, that's not a weapon, but it's a... a I guess a that's really what I'm getting. Yeah, I, I was really not being clear. I think that's mainly what I'm looking for, is that... Because the, the, the image that a layman has of the Vietnam War is the helicopter. Yes. And the guy sitting up there with a machine gun shooting into this jungle Whatever, and whatnot, yeah. you know. But it's also the search and rescue, and the you know you, you, uh, interviewing you know Chaplain Kaiser, uh, who you of course know. Uh, that's how he got from you know base to base to to administer uh, spiritual uh, advice and whatnot, and. Uh, it just the endearing the, the endearing image is this this helicopter popping around. Yeah, it was the jeep. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, and you didn't have to worry about roads being mined. Good point. But you didn't have to worry about somebody shooting at you. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if that blade came off the top, you had all the aerodynamical characteristics of a rock. Yeah. And uh, it was awkward. But See, my first introduction to that was as a child. My father, uh, as you know, was with um, um, Air America. And that's how he traveled around there, you know. And I remember him saying one time how he was shot at from a helicopter. I just had this image of my dad and this, you know. And the soldiers are going through that every day. I mean, my dad did that, you know, for one month doing a tour around there and whatnot. But were you ever uh, endangered in that way oh, in, yeah. in a helicopter? Uh, my best story is that when uh, my first tour, when I was an aide de camp for the second half of my tour, uh, time for me to go home, I'd selected. We had, the general had selected an aide to take my place, who was a friend of mine, and typically I, we flew together. And the first day, which was three or four days before I was to go home, that I decided I wasn't going to fly. I was going to let Jack go with the general by himself. A bullet went through the seat I would have been sitting in. So, I guess that's a near miss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as your um, tour of duty, the second tour of duty, wound down. Was there any thought on your part, or did you have a choice in terms of re-upping re and staying in Vietnam? Or well, what were your I, I, I could have extended, but I was newly married. I'd been, I'd, uh, I'd been married a year, then went to Vietnam for a year, right. and uh, I had an attractive young lady who wanted me home. Mm -hmm. uh, we had plans and reservations to go into the Caribbean and spend a couple of weeks. And uh, two days before I got home, she came down with tonsillitis. Oh. So we spent it in Cleveland <laughs> in the hospital, <laughs> me feeding her ice cream. <laughs> uh, the other half is we saved a lot of money. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now that's real love, you know. You know Caribbean or feeding her ice cream. Yeah, okay. Um, beyond just the, 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 the mayor, you could have still stayed in the military. Oh, I did. Okay. I certainly right. did. And I was a regular officer, so therefore I could have. I believe I had a four-year obligation, and I hit four years about then. While I was in Vietnam, my, mm -hmm. towards the end of my second tour, I hit four years. So I certainly could have gotten out, but it never occurred to me to do that. Okay. So what was the decision then? What did you do? Well, it wasn't a decision. I had decided before okay. that I was going to stay in, and I was programmed to go to the Fort Knox, to the Armor Officer Advance Course, which was, while I was in Vietnam, my second tour, I was selected for promotion to major uh, quite f fast. Uh, quite far ahead of my contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So that sort of put me on a fast track. As an infantry officer, I was about the same time selected to go to the Armor Officer Advanced Course, which is a, an honor. What is it? What is it? I know Fort it's, Knox it's, is because of the goal, but what yeah. is the, why is this an honor? Why is this? Military education, a, a brand new officer goes through basic course. Sure. And it, it's everything. It, it's not, this is your right foot or this is your left foot. You're supposed to know that already. <laughs> but, but introduction to the weapons, to tactics, to that sure. sort of thing. Uh, at the captain level, there's, that's called the basic course, the, is the advanced course. And it's, it, 
at that point you're ready to be going into uh, battalion and brigade staff, so it's orientation on what that's like, mm -hmm. as well as a, just a different level of things. Then there's the Command and General Staff College and the War College. So that's the prog progression. Uh, and typically one goes to one's own branch school through basic and advanced. Uh, so the fact that I was permitted, selected to go to mm -hmm. Fort Knox was, was quite an honor. What was that training like? I mean, what were we talking about? School training? Are you talking yeah, about? It's school training. Okay. And it was orientation of battalion tactics as opposed to company and platoon tactics mm -hmm. and brigade tactics and the, the logistics side. Uh, many, many great generals have said that uh, tactics make you look good. Logistics is what wins the war. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of logistics, um, maintenance, uh, resupply, Lots of that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are your teachers? I don't, I don't need na necessarily names, but who? who Army are officers. Okay. They're, they're, so these are retired officers. No, no, no. These, these are, are active okay. duty. Uh, they were they were the ones who had just come back from doing it. Ah. So we had majors, lieutenant colonels, some captains as instructors, who. Uh, this is just a rotation. They came from doing it. They they were very active, contemporary mm -hmm. people. Now that doesn't mean they were all good instructors. Uh, I remember we had one uh, instructor, I don't remember anything about him except he liked to pace while he was talking. So we got together, I confess to being one of the ringleaders, and we agreed that at a certain signal we would all look at him where he was and not follow him. So all of a sudden he was used to us watching him as he went back and forth, <laughs> and all of a sudden we were looking this way and he was over there, and he started leaning back trying to get into our vision. Uh, I was a little bit of a troublemaker in, in that school. Uh, but uh, Who were your fellow officers that you were, were they guys that also had come from Vietnam? And many of them. Okay, all right. At, at that point, typically the advanced course is typically captains, maybe a very senior first lieutenant, maybe a junior major. Mm. Uh, but I think there were like 150 of us in that wow. class and probably 120 of them were captains. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, Where do you go from there? Uh, from there, I had been, I, I got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, what I really wanted to do was go back to West Point. My tactical officer from West Point had been my battalion commander in Vietnam, well, in the United States, and we deployed to Vietnam. And he was selected for promotion and went to West Point to head, to be a leader in the tactical department there. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said, Denny, if you really want to come to West Point, since you've been selected for major fast and you, you know, you're, you're on the fast track, I can get you there even though you're a little early. Uh, do you want me to do that? And I said, yes. And then while I was at Fort Knox, the Army came along and said, hey, do you want to go to graduate school? We'll send you. Oh, wow. Well, I did want to go to graduate school. So I called Colonel Tallman and said, you know, I'm having this struggle, and he said, my advice is don't go to graduate school now. You can get this, you can get that later. I didn't want what I wanted to hear, and it isn't the choice that I made, but, uh, so I made the other choice. I elected to go to graduate school at the University of Texas at El Paso to major in political science slash international relations. And Colonel Tallman came down to visit at West Point. I don't remember what the occasion was. We had him over to the house. I mean, we were friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he gave me that, well, Denny, I see you have picked the other choice. And I thought, I felt it. Like, yeah. Anyway, I, got, I did go from there to the University of Texas. Uh, Fort Bliss, Texas is right nearby, so we had plenty of military support. Uh, I was a student there for about 18 months to get my master's mm -hmm. degree. And the, my utilization tour for that, you have to have a utilization tour. The, you can either go to utilize a master's degree the Army paid for, or you can go to combat zone. The but utilization tour, I don't, they, know, I don't understand well, that. You have to do something that uses that training. Okay. We okay. didn't send you for this degree just so you just, could have yeah, it. Yeah, right, right. Uh, well, ROTC is a, a normal place. Mm -hmm. Well, they selected me to go to, well, actually, first they said, we, you haven't been to, uh, in Vietnam as a major yet. And now you're, uh, I was promoted to major while I was there. Yeah. And I said, guys, that would be three years out of six. I really don't want to do that. Yeah knowing that that's all I can say, they're mm -hmm. going to send me where I go, sure. but I did make, or I may have trouble convincing my wife that I should stay in the Army kind of sounds. So they sent me instead to be the ROTC department at Stanford. Well, that was cool. The, uh, the person, Stanford was at that time seriously considering throwing ROTC off campus. I was just going to ask you that. This is the climate of 
people yeah. burning RLTCs. Oh, yes. Boy, that, boy, were they. And it turns out that there was a, an attorney who was leading the charge. This attorney was a graduate of Stanford, Stanford Law, Stanford Army ROTC, and he was my first cousin. Oh, wow. Uh, by so, leading the charge, you mean trying to shut it down? Yeah. So Marilyn, and I, by the time Marilyn and I got there and got settled, it had been agreed that over the next two and a half years they would phase out and go away. But there was still a lot of unrest. And I was able to work with my cousin to keep violence out of the game. Indeed, the two and a half years I was there, I had students in my office one time, less than, I mean, demonstrators, stayed less than 10 minutes and didn't say a dirty word. And I took cadets to, the, to their meetings and engaged in dialogue and did a lot of things. It was interesting, but uh, we, we were leaving. We did phase out. There still were, I mean, the impression is so often, once again, with the media that, that you know, everybody was anti-war, anti-Vietnam, anti-military, but there still were American boys that were joining ROTC. They, they wanted sure to, and I think it's important that those, those voices be heard as well. That's quite true. Now, in some cases, people acting in their own enlightened best interest, many of my, many of my ROTC cadets were graduate students because they rode their student deferment through uh, undergraduate school and then took ROTC so they could go to graduate school hoping that one of two things would happen. One, the war would end before they could serve right. or if they did serve, they'd at least serve as officers. Right. So uh, I was, I turned 30 while I was there, uh, had, a, had one master's degree at the time, was working on a second one at Stanford and I'm no dope, but in the presence of Stanford graduate students Let's just say I was often not the smartest guy in the classroom, yeah. and maybe not even one of the smartest guys. Yeah. Yeah. But they were darn good students. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have problems with normal student problems, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I was proud of all of them. They took the heat mm -hmm. on campus, and the reality is, is that like everything else, there's only 10% of people who care about anything. <laughs> you, you know. Yeah, it's often not thought of in that way. It's yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm grasping for words here because it's it's this. I'm trying to picture America at this time. Stanford, one of our top universities. The the media is full of you know the anti-war demonstrations and people out in the streets and all this kind of stuff. Um, what was the mood on campus? With, you know, you're you're right there with the ROTC, which is you know the enemy is easy to spot. Okay, right. um, and you know the demonstration. But, but what was the mood of the campus though, really? And you were saying 10 percent, you know, even care. But well, I was also a student because I was working right. on my master's degree right. in education at the time, as well as I had colleagues, faculty. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a member mm -hmm. of the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty benign. I mean, there were the there were the wild-eyed. Yeah, the ones, and there, there were a few that weren't in ROTC, but they were generally supportive. But most of them were indifferent. Mm -hmm. They were there to get an education, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, there are horrible things that happened in a lot of places, but they didn't happen in Stanford. Okay. And I don't think it was because there was an iron fist somewhere. I think it was just because uh, they were too busy either partying or studying. Mm -hmm to want to do things like, mm -hmm. yeah, when there was a demonstration in the plaza or something, a lot of people turned out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then 30 minutes later or 45 minutes later or an hour later, they went on to do whatever they were going to do. Right, right. Uh, now, I started in college in 72, political science. And the thing that shocked me was the outright preaching of socialism and, in some cases, communism as the ideal as opposed to the, and I was, I mean, being a naive person growing up in China, I come out there and then suddenly I'm, the, the very things that I have been taught just the opposite of are being taught in the Harold classes. Was Stanford like that? I mean, what was the political science teachers like? Were they as blatant as some of the others? Well, I, I wasn't in the political science department there, okay. but, but there was some really, f by my standards, far out, blatantly untrue propaganda mm -hmm. going on. But that was the exception, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, 
That was the rule that where I was. I mean, it just. Well, again, I I, I don't want to generalize sure. based on the few no, people I that I that yeah. I saw. Right. Certainly in the education department, uh, there were some people that were not happy to have soldiers mm -hmm. in their, among their students. Right. But they didn't express it in a way that was harmful mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. or me or mm -hmm. to whatever. Uh, I was rarely in conversations, even just in the student union, mm -hmm. that were in any way hostile. Okay. There, I had a lot of people ask questions, inquiring mm -hmm. minds. Uh, I, I talked to anybody about anything, I, mm -hmm. and I, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I encouraged all my staff to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, we had the reputation of being uh, at Hell's Gates, but in reality it was pretty pleasant. Okay. And my son was born then too, so that mm -hmm. sort of kept me busy mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So once that two year period was over with, where did you go from there? Uh, I was selected from there to go to the Armed Forces Staff College, which is a, 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 a like Command and General Staff College, it, except it's an all services kind of thing in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and from there to Germany, where I was, became the second in command of a mechanized infantry battalion. Was there a career path that you were on? Yes. You, you, okay. All right. I'll try and explain that to me because, you know, if you're going to be an engineer, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, there's certain steps you're going through. And I'm trying to get a vision of the steps you're going through to get where? To be a general. I mean, that's, okay. that's, that, that's the right. goal. Okay. All right. I need to note that today is February 2nd. It's Groundhog's Day. But yeah. it is also the, the, the day that it's the foundation day for the 26th Infantry Regiment, which is right. the unit that I had in Germany. Uh, so I, I need to acknowledge that I went to the 26th Infantry Blue okay. Skaters and, uh, uh, and that this is their anniversary day. Mm -hmm. But the career pattern typically for a, an officer to combat arms is you're a platoon leader, then you're a, a, probably at a battalion staff somewhere, then you're a company commander, then you're at a battalion or brigade staff. Uh, then as a, as a major, you would probably go to a much higher level staff somewhere to come back as a lieutenant colonel command a battalion, mm -hmm. to then go to the War College, uh, serve on another higher staff, come back in as a colonel to be a brigade commander, and on to stars. Mm -hmm. So it was important that f for an operations infantry guy like me, that you be in the operations sections. And uh, that's, you notice I was in the operations section mm -hmm. in Vietnam as a captain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I went to Germany, I was actually assigned as the operations officer for an infantry battalion. But a couple of months later, the the other major in the battalion, who was the executive officer, uh, rotated home, and I was the only one available. So I became the executive officer mm -hmm. or second mm -hmm. command of that battalion and stayed that way for most of three years. Mm -hmm. um, and another major came in who was junior to me, who became the operations officer. So for three years, I basically was the second in command. Uh, mm -hmm of the 1st Battalion, 26th Infantry wow. in Germany. Uh, it was a marvelous, marvelous time, uh, culturally what was, and everywhere. What was Germany like at that time? Uh, one, I had been over in Germany before as a cadet, and uh, there were four marks to the dollar. A mark and a quarter were wow. the same size. They fit in the same slot machine. Wow. Uh, now it was about two marks to the dollar, maybe two and a half. Mm -hmm. So one, it was expensive. Right, right. Uh, but it was it was pleasant. It was friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a nice place to go. I spoke some German. Uh, not enough to do business, but I never stayed lost or hungry too long. Right. Uh, my wife and I and our, our young son had, wanted to do some traveling, and while I was I worked long hours, uh, we did always were able to blast off for a weekend or something here mm -hmm. or there. A um, lot of training, a lot of international training. We trained with Germans. We trained with the Brits. We trained with the French. Um, our battalion was very, very active. We were, in the strategic sense, our battalion was part of the Army Reserve, mm -hmm. so that if the enemy attacked, we would be part of the reserve force that would counter the attack. This would be the Russians. Yes. Okay. The Russian, well, the, the Soviets, right. because they include their allies. Right. And I remember at one point, one of our battalion commanders decided, okay, we're going to ask the intelligence apparatus if everything goes like they think it is, and of course it won't, but if it did, what would be the first enemy unit we would engage? And they came up with, uh, I don't remember, 126 Motorized Rifle Regiment. I don't mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. So the next question was, okay, who commands them? Who are the key officers? The typical kind of stuff that you'd mm -hmm. like to learn. And we found out that they came up with 
eight or nine of the 50 or so officers in that regiment, but they all have the same first name, which is Fanu. That was just too much to be coincidence. Mm -hmm. So I went back through the intelligence channel. It took a month to find out that Fanu stands for first name unknown. <laughs> 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 uh, oh my gosh. But uh, Reforger was a big exercise then where mm -hmm. the, uh, some forces in the states were flown over to reunite for the thing and we were the, in, the, in the third brigade of the 1st Infantry Division and the division minus was in the states so that Reforger exercise every year we participated in. By exercise you mean actually going out into the field yes. and I don't want to call it play acting, but but we did major field maneuvers. Okay, all right. Every not just then, but multiple times a year, there were big maneuver areas that were just for that. But we also did general maneuver in farmlands, mm -hmm. particularly in the winter when the farmlands are frozen over, so mm -hmm. we wouldn't do too much damage. Was the nuclear threat taken into account? Oh yes. Well, let's talk about that. Well, that's that was one of the big ifs. Would it be played by whom, when, uh, at the battalion level? Or originally, the Army, when I first got in the Army as an arm, as a second lieutenant, the Army had a nuclear capable weapon at battalion level, which was called the Honest John. No, it was called the Davy Crockett. And I was briefly in my first unit, the Davy Crockett Project Officer, but they went away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they rightly figured out that a battalion could easily be being consumed while the rest of the army was successful and they didn't need a nuke being popped at, under that kind of circumstances. Yeah. So by the time I was in Germany they were long gone. Uh, but we were, we, you know, we practiced dispersion, we, you know, gas masks and that sort of thing. Uh, but we really didn't expect that. Most of our training assumed that wouldn't happen. Okay. All right. Um, you were saying about uh, with your allies. What were the, the what comments would you have on? You know, you're out there with the French. You're out there with the British. Was there a real big difference between the tactics and all that, or was it a fairly cohesive unit? Well, the biggest problem was communication. Not only different languages, but you mean different things by this word. <laughs> okay. Uh, so a lot of what we did was just talk to each other, and I, I mean while we were maneuvering. Uh, and we deliberately would do things, like if there was a British and a French unit, we'd have British, American, French, American, so we'd, we'd force that flank-to-flank -flank liaison. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was often confusing, but it, it, got, mm -hmm. it got better as time went on, mm -hmm. as you'd expect. How long did that period, I, I missed that? I was there three years. Three years, okay, all right. Um, what were the highlights for you for those three years? I mean, you mentioned, of course, traveling your family and all that, but... Well, professional highlights were just the opportunity to participate in the Reforger exercise where the whole division deployed from, from the United States and we, and, and the, we, we worked with them and, and working with foreign nationals. And this was also the time when the Army was up to its ears in druggies. And I played a, a major role as second command in trying to stay on top of and control that and working with our duty officers to get into that stuff and 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 we for the most part were successful I'm not naive enough to think that we were hugely successful but we we did not ever have an incident where drug use affected negatively any training that I was ever aware of were this was this a result of returning Vietnam vets that had picked up a habit, or is it just because drugs were so available in Germany? This was in the early and mid. This is middle middle seventies in yeah. Germany, and you know, it, drugs were available everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so mostly what marijuana, hashish, uh, or are you talking about heroin, cocaine, kind of things? Heroin and coke too. Oh wow. Uh, you know, when we had the middle of the night uh, full court squeeze, we'd run a whole unit into the basketball court and they'd all have to pee in a bottle and you know we did all of that kind of stuff um, but I, I believe very strongly that I the units that I saw were combat ready mm -hmm. I'm glad we didn't have to fight yeah. but they were ready yeah yeah so I enjoyed it thoroughly as a guy for the German culture to spend three years in Germany yeah. was was great uh, there, there's there was so much about it my wife still has fond memories of it mm -hmm. my son was like from two to five, so yeah. he doesn't remember a whole lot. Right, right, right. 
Um, I want to put you in contact with a professor over at Calvin. Uh, she's a German teacher. She uh, instituted the oral history project for her German class, and specifically what she wanted was these students to interview Americans who were stationed in Germany because they wanted to get that, that story. So I'm very, very pleased I put you in contact with her. Uh, after the three years, what were your options, number one, and what were you planning to do, what well, did you want to do? Well, obviously, we want to go to the States, and Germany was a tad cold, and my wife loves warm weather, so she was encouraging me so to find someplace mission. warm. <laughs> uh, and it turned out that a friend of mine ended up in infantry major assignments and he said Denny I can get you to Tampa well needless to say that did wonders for my marriage mm -hmm. uh, I was assigned to the US readiness command which was a, a joint command uh, in their planning section I was uh, sent there as a, as a joint planner this incidentally is a very good use for the schooling that I got at the Armed Forces Staff College before I went to Germany that's what it prepared me for okay uh, I was initially the war, I was responsible for the plan for general war in Europe and the backup planner for the Mideast. And after a year or so, the guy who was the primary planner for the Mideast rotated and I became the primary planner for the Mideast also. So I spent four years as the Mideast war planner. Uh, and we were starting from nothing. Uh, we, we didn't have much of anything. Indeed, I had a book of Kipling. Uh, I'm a Kipling nut. Mm. And on some of the countries, all the information we had in that headquarters was, out, was in my book on Kipling. Uh, now, we were able to get more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but Readiness Command was responsible for deploying forces overseas. We didn't fight them once, we got, once they got there, but we had to know where they were in the United States, get them ready to go, and get them gone. You know, Army and Air Force forces only. And it was exciting. The neat thing about it was, as well, everything was top secret. Uh, so you couldn't really come to work early because you had to have two people present to open the safe. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really stay late unless there was something going on. Uh, so it was, uh, it was an eight to five, five days a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had to work, in, I was there four years. I had to work weekends twice. And one of those weekends, I was sitting at the dining room table of the four-star general who commanded it doing work. And I figured if he was working, I'm working. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, had, I had no regrets. It was a lot of fun and it was a, it was a very good uh, decompression time for my mm -hmm. family. Now, let me understand your, your, the purpose here. You're in charge of a group that's anticipating a war in the Middle East. Yes. Without trying to give away secrets or whatever, but, but what were the main hot points? I mean, well, obviously the, the, the uh, Israel Palestinians and all that, but what were you actually watching over? Where, where were the hot spots? Well, let me, let me say this. One of the things that I, I, the team I was on, did was we, we wrote the, what became the first draft of Desert Shield. Hmm. We were looking at defending the oil. Mm -hmm. We thought we were defending against the Russians when we wrote it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't the first draft, but it became the first draft mm -hmm. of Desert Shield. Uh, we were looking at uh, where we state would stage ships from and that sort of thing. So yes, it, yeah, basically it was the oil rich areas, mm -hmm. particularly Saudi and, and, and Israel. Mm -hmm. But uh, Africa north of Sahara, we were looking at the, the Libya and the mm -hmm. Sudan and that area. But the primary hotspots was the, the, the Saudi Iraq, Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was in that position, uh, lost the country. Ethiopia oh, okay. went from uh, being a pro-Western country right. to, to being a very un-pro-Western mm -hmm, country mm -hmm. when Haile Selassie died. Right. Uh, so that was one of the things that uh, was most interesting to, to observe. But you're, or, So you're, you're not actually gathering intelligence and whatnot. What you're doing is, is preparing plans and strategies if something breaks out. The, our, our specific job, if you were the general on the ground over there, mm -hmm. you would say, okay, if this happens, this is how I want to fight it. I want an infantry battalion and I want an Air Force squadron. And I want, so we put those together. Okay. This battalion can be ready first. This squadron can gotcha. be ready. These ships will come in to pick up these people at this port and that we will stage them in the way you want them. Or if you ask for something you, we, that doesn't make sense, we would tell you that it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, 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 do you, how would you yeah, like right. how else would you yeah, like it right right uh, so I spent some time in Germany doing liaisoning and that sort of thing and 
We were looking Pacific. What was the thinking of the time as to where were the real hot spots? Well, at the, in the Mideast? Yes, you mentioned Ethiopia, that's you know one, but I mean, was... Uh, you know, certainly Iran. Okay. And certainly Arab Israel. Right. But, uh, Iraq was off again on again. Um, Syria was always crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt? Egypt, yeah, I, th I think M Mubarak got assassinated right about in that's there. That's what you see, that's where I'm getting at, is yeah. there's my recollection, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on Middle East affairs at all, um, there was a lot of things going on. There were a lot of things going on, but we were primarily concerned with those areas where the United States might, okay. in, might intervene okay. militarily. All right, so even though there may be an assassination or something, if, if it didn't directly affect military, America, deployment. military deployment, then you're aware of it, you're keeping your eye on it, but you've got other things to deal with. Yes. Okay, all right, well, that makes sense. That three-year period ends. I was there four years. Four-year period ends. Where did you go next? Well, we really liked Tampa. It was warm there, and we were doing really well, so I, saw, I did what I could to see if I could get another tour there, and I landed the position as the professor of military science at the University of Tampa. Oh. Um, which was delightful. It was five miles closer to home, and... Uh, uh, you're still active military. Yes, active But you're military. actually a professor. Yes. Okay. Uh, my assignment was as professor of military science mm -hmm. at the University of Tampa. Uh, University of Tampa had a very good, a very good program. It was very pro ROTC. Uh, they had a, pro, a an Army ROTC scholarship. Typically meant they paid your room and board mm -hmm. and gave you a usually hundred dollar a month stipend. The University of Tampa had a policy that if you came with a military ROTC scholarship, they give you free room and board because they figured out you're not going to be an academic problem. Mm -hmm. you, we don't have to worry about you going to pay tuition or not. Right and you're going to be a highly motivated student who's not going to get in trouble. So it's worth it to us to, to attract you. Yes, yes. So they made my life a whole heck of a lot easier uh, by, by having that position in place. Now the draft is over with by this time? Yes, the okay. draft is over. So what was your reaction to that, just on a personal You know, the, the draft ended pretty much when I came back from Vietnam mm -hmm. my second time. I thought that was silly. I thought, I felt from all kinds of different levels that Americans need to know that freedom isn't free mm -hmm. and that everybody needs to pay the price. But from, from a different perspective, uh, as a company commander, my first, my, my first sergeant was, of course, my f senior enlisted aide, and his right-hand man was the company clerk who kept track of who's here and who's mm -hmm. there. And we couldn't imagine having a company clerk who wasn't a college graduate. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and indeed, what the Army did was they took the company clerks out of all the companies and con condensed them at Italian, ah. which was a mixed blessing. But uh, uh, I still contend that a draft would be good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I'm in the majority. Yeah. But uh, we, we, I think that America needs it mm -hmm. for our culture, and I also think that given the fact that we're in the middle of a war right now, we yeah. need it. Yeah. Um, so what was your experience with the uh, University of, of Tampa? Was it pleasant? Was it was a good, good Very experience? Very pleasant. Uh, Fairly I, easy, I, I would imagine, compared to some of the things that you've done before. It was. Uh, I thought about going for a third master's. I got the MBA program, but decided not to. Um, I, th I was on the provost council. I chaired many faculty committees. I was quite accepted mm. as a colleague by most of my, my peers. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I was able to reach out into the community and, and do a lot of stuff, not to promote the military, but just public service type mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had some very, very, very good students. And of course, I was able to attract a lot of good college scholarship students because of that program. Mm -hmm. It was just a very good growing time. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of good for the university, I think. Uh, I, did a, I, even, I even thought about retiring at the end of that tour and maybe trying to find a position, taking a position on the faculty at the University of Tampa. Mm -hmm. But that did, didn't work out, but I certainly looked into it. Uh, I really felt at home there. So what did happen? Uh, I decided that what I really wanted to do was I wanted to go back to the Armed Forces Staff College on their faculty at Norfolk. I had been their student. I spent four years as a war planner. I had just what they needed. They thought so too, but they didn't have an opening in my rank at the time. 
but we were in almost weekly communication. They knew that somebody would, something would pop. I turned down Hawaii. I turned down every, I was going to Norfolk. And one day the phone rang and some captain said, Colonel, you have waited too long. You are going to Wyoming, Michigan. And my honest to God response was, make up your mind, Wyoming or Michigan. <laughs> That happened to me too, by the way. Similar and, uh, anyways. And he said, no, sir, you're going to be an, a, an Army advisor to the Michigan National Guard. We had to send you, and it's now. And I could say yes or yes. It was one of my <laughs> choices, you know. Uh, so my wife wasn't pleased with it. Uh, she grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and didn't like northern winters. She, one of the reasons she married me was I promised to take her away. Uh, I'd only been to Michigan once in my life. I came to the Detroit riots in 1967 as an airborne company commander. And while I was impressed, it wasn't positively. Uh, but I had no choice. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to Grand Rapids and got settled in and found out that Grand Rapids isn't like Detroit. As a matter of fact, nothing in Michigan is like Detroit. <laughs> uh, and my, the, the, I was the brigade advisor to the 46th Brigade, which is headquartered in Wyoming, but has uh, battalions all over the state, well, mm -hmm. the Lower Peninsula. So I traveled the whole state uh, and really ba basically fell in love with Michigan. Uh, at the same time, uh, my wife was settling in and my son started seventh grade. Uh, we figured after a year that this was a good place to raise the family, so I took the second year to find a job and I retired after being here two years. Wow. Um, I loved every minute I was in the Army, but it was, it was probably time to get out. I had to make it a, a really quality decision while I was uh, at, at the University of Tampa. Was I going to chase the stars or was I going to, to bow out at this point? And I weighed the pros and cons because I was offered battalion command while I was there. I would have commanded a battalion in Panama, which was a pretty hot place at the yeah, time. Yeah. And I, I concluded that no, it was I had had a great career, I loved it, but what I really wanted to do was spend more time with my family. So I declined that battalion command, and at the, shortly thereafter I declined an opportunity to go to the War College. And once I had done that, uh, yeah. I was on the retirement track. Yeah. Yeah. And while I didn't have to retire from here, uh, I was looking to, and the Army wasn't surprised. I didn't get any fight when I, when hmm. I bowed out. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed working with the Michigan National Guard. I had developed some fairly typical both general public and active army attitude about the weekend warriors. And I found out that I was wrong. Mm. Uh, and I publicly said so, particularly to many of my weekend warriors, <laughs> uh, which, which made me pretty popular with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't, didn't make it up. They were good. They were darn good. And, uh, we did a lot of things together, nights and weekends yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I was really proud of them and remain proud of them. Yeah. Yeah. Still have a lot of friends from the Michigan Guard. Well, I think that's a good place to wind it down. And, uh, you know, one of the, the pleasures of doing an interview with you is I don't have to ask a whole lot of questions. <laughs> I, I'm about to ask one and then you answer it before I even, I, I was really curious about why you didn't chase the stars. I like the way you put that too, you know, chasing the stars. That was going to be my next question and immediately you uh, already answered it. Um, as a summing up though, um, you've said on several uh, occasions throughout this interview and the last interview how the military has really affected you and you think that this is an important thing for every you know, American to go through. Um, let's, let's get into the philosophic mode, if you will, and <clears throat> where, how did the, the, the military experience itself shape the person that you are today? Well, I think I grew up like every other kid. My, my mother was not really pleased when I told her I think I wanted to make the Army my career. Uh, but like most mothers, she supported me at whatever I did. Uh, and I, I think I approached the military with a totally unrealistic perspective, mm. being a typical knife. I come from a long line of draft dodgers. Uh, I had nobody in my direct line, as far as I know, served in the military mm. in either direction. Um, but I did have the sense of adventure, the sense of wanting to, to serve, the sense of my, wanting my life to make a difference. And uh, certainly one thing I learned in Vietnam, it, 
one thing I learned from being shot at was that I, I, I am very capable of fear, and I'm also capable of functioning while being afraid. Mm. And that certainly changed me substantially because most people never know. You know, if I threaten to hit you in the nose, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to have a bloody nose mm -hmm. if you can't stop me. Yeah. But a bullet or a bullet to one of your people. And, and the other thing is that I made decisions that sent men into combat, uh, and some of them died. And I had to live with that. And I found out I could. That, uh, that, af that affected me. But, but more than that, and this is, this is somewhat trite, uh, I believed and I believe more now that freedom isn't free. That uh, there's a tenet of, of Christianity, and I'm a Christian, that says that the basic nature of man is evil. It takes a relationship with a good God to bring out good. And we can see that, we see the good, mm -hmm. but, but the self-interest aspect. And there are not going to be people out there who are going to let you go off and be good. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, right after the election in, in Iraq yesterday, there was a statement by one of the terrorist forces that we hate f democracy. Yeah. Uh, they, they are very honest, but they're not alone. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I am very much a patriot, but n not so much a patriot of America as a patriot of democracy. Uh, I have seen countries where democracy doesn't exist, maybe it didn't name, but not in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a lot of places, I've, I've seen things, and I've talked to people, and I realize just how lucky we are to be Americans. And if we can share some of the blessings that we have, that's a good thing. But that one of the challenges of being uh, at the top of the heap, as it were, mm -hmm. is that we're hated, too. Uh, there's nothing we can do to stop that. Yeah. Uh, and that we really need to be able to defend ourselves and to defend others who wish to do, by the democracy sense of the term, mm -hmm. do good. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that everybody, every state should be a democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm, but certainly uh, the value of the human individual needs more recognition in most of the world than it gets now. And there are those who don't do that want to take ours away from us. Yeah. And that means that somebody's got to be out there paying the price. Uh, so uh, in that sense, I'm a wild-eyed patriot. Uh, it's not my country right or wrong, but it is certainly. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that people want to take away from us we have a chance to share it. Yeah. And we can't let them. So. <laughs> <laughs>